Vâng, xin kính chào tất cả các quý vị đại biểu, các vị khách quý, các chuyên gia trong chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới và đặc biệt là hơn 130 tham dự viên trong nước đến từ nhiều lĩnh vực đã có mặt tham gia khóa tập huấn cơ bản về chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới ngày hôm nay. Vâng, kính thưa quý vị, trong bối cảnh người chuyển giới tại Việt Nam vẫn còn phải đối mặt với rất nhiều khó khăn và rào cản, thì một trong những khát khao và cũng là thử thách lớn nhất của người chuyển giới đó là được can thiệp y tế. Tuy vậy, Tại Việt Nam, hàng ngày vẫn có rất nhiều người chuyển giới phải đánh đổi sức khỏe, thậm chí là tính mạng để sử dụng những ống hóc môn không rõ nguồn gốc, được mua từ những nguồn trôi nổi hay từ chợ đen. Rất nhiều người chuyển giới thì phải tìm đến những cơ sở y tế không chính thống, cả trong nước và nước ngoài để được thực hiện can thiệp y tế. Đã có biết bao trường hợp người chuyển giới vì những rủi ro trong quá trình can thiệp y tế mà phải trả giá bằng mạng sống của mình. Nhưng dù có may mắn vượt qua quá trình can thiệp y tế thì người chuyển giới vẫn luôn gặp phải những khó khăn về nhiều khía cạnh như khía cạnh chăm sóc sức khỏe của mình để có một cuộc sống như bao người khác. Có thể thấy đáp ứng nhu cầu chính đáng này là một trong những điều tất yếu và cần thiết để hỗ trợ người chuyển giới. Nhưng chúng ta cần hỗ trợ những gì để người chuyển giới thực sự khỏe mạnh về cả thể chất lẫn tinh thần thì đó vẫn còn là một câu hỏi còn bỏ ngỏ trên hành trình còn rất dài và nhiều gian nan này. Và để đồng hành hỗ trợ người chuyển giới trên hành trình được là chính mình, lần đầu tiên vụ pháp chế Bộ Y tế, Bệnh viện Hữu nghị Việt Đức Trung tâm Hỗ trợ Sáng kiến Phát triển Cộng đồng SCDI phối hợp cùng Hiệp hội Chuyên gia Sức khỏe cho Người Chuyển giới Thế giới phối hợp tổ chức khóa tập huấn cơ bản về chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới. Khóa tập huấn diễn ra trong 4 ngày, từ ngày 14 tháng 1 đến ngày 17 tháng 1 năm 2020 với mong muốn huy động sự quan tâm của cộng đồng, đặc biệt là từ các bác sĩ trong nước trong nhiều lĩnh vực nhằm hỗ trợ cho người chuyển giới trên nhiều góc độ như sức khỏe tâm thần, điều trị hóc môn, can thiệp y tế, điều trị nội tiết, và rất nhiều các nội dung hữu ích khác nhằm hướng tới phục vụ thực tiễn lâm sàng cũng như sẵn sàng cung cấp các dịch vụ chuyên biệt cho người chuyển giới khi luật chuyển đổi giới tính chính thức được thông qua. Đến với khóa tập huấn ngày hôm nay, tôi xin trân trọng giới thiệu các vị đại biểu khách quý. Tôi xin trân trọng giới thiệu Phó Giáo sư Tiến sĩ Đồng Văn Hệ, Phó Giám đốc Bệnh viện Hữu nghị Việt Đức. Tôi xin trân trọng giới thiệu Phó giáo sư tiến sĩ Hoàng Long, Phó giám đốc Trung tâm Đào tạo và Chỉ đạo tuyến Bệnh viện Hữu nghị Việt Đức. Tôi xin trân trọng giới thiệu bà Elbert Ackerman, Đại sứ Vương quốc Hà Lan tại Việt Nam. Tôi xin trân trọng giới thiệu bà Đinh Thị Thu Thủy, chuyên viên vụ pháp chế Bộ Y tế. Về phía ban tổ chức, tôi xin trân trọng giới thiệu bác sĩ Khuất Thị Hải Oanh, Giám đốc Trung tâm Hỗ trợ Sáng kiến Phát triển Cộng đồng SCDI. Tôi xin được giới thiệu các thành viên đến từ tổ chức World Pass và nhóm giảng viên là các tiến sĩ, bác sĩ giàu kinh nghiệm chuyên môn trong lĩnh vực chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới sẽ đồng hành cùng chúng ta trong những ngày tập huấn tới. Tôi cũng xin hân hạnh giới thiệu và chào mừng sự có mặt của đại diện mạng lưới của người chuyển giới châu Á, APTN. Vâng, và một thành phần không thể thiếu sẽ làm nên tập huấn của chúng ta đó chính là các tham sự viên, là các bác sĩ phẫu thuật, bác sĩ nội tiết, bác sĩ tạo hình thẩm mỹ, bác sĩ chuyên khoa nhi, nhà tâm lý, giảng viên đến từ các trường đại học và đại diện đến từ cộng đồng người chuyển giới Việt Nam hứa hẹn sẽ làm nên một khóa tập huấn với những thành công tốt đẹp phía trước. Xin quý vị hãy cho một tràng pháo tay để chúng ta có thể chào mừng đến tất cả các vị khách quý và các tham dự viên ngày hôm nay ạ. Xin cảm ơn quý vị. Kính thưa quý vị, sau đây tôi xin mời Phó Giáo sư Tiến sĩ Đồng Văn Hệ, Phó Giám đốc Bệnh viện Hữu nghị Việt Đức sẽ có đôi lời phát biểu chào mừng khóa tập huấn ạ. Xin mời Phó Giáo sư Tiến sĩ Đồng Văn Hệ. Good morning everybody. Let me speak in Vietnamese. À, xin uh, chào mừng tất cả quý vị đại biểu đã đến dự uh, một cái hội thảo rất là đặc biệt ngày hôm nay. Thì uh, nhân dịp uh, năm cũ sắp qua, À, năm mới sắp tới thì xin mạch cho lãnh đạo bệnh lãnh đạo của hội bệnh viện Nghi Việt Đức xin được uh, kính chúc quý vị uh, một năm mới uh, mạnh khỏe, an khang, thịnh vượng. À, kính thưa quý vị thì uh, thực sự thì tôi mới uh, biết được cái uh, buổi hội thảo ngày hôm nay rất là trong vài ngày vừa rồi thôi và tôi cảm thấy rất là tò mò. À, phải nói là và tôi rất là thấy vui vì là cái vấn đề này thì không riêng gì À, không riêng gì các à, bác sĩ mà rất là nhiều những người dân thông thường và tôi được biết rằng là tỷ lệ những người mà có nhu cầu chuyển giới thì có thể lên tới 0,3 hoặc là 0,5% dân số có nghĩa rằng ở Việt Nam với 100 triệu dân thì chúng ta có tới nửa triệu người là có cái nhu cầu này 
Và như bạn MC vừa có giới thiệu ấy, thì cái chuyện người ta không hiểu đúng, không biết cách đúng là làm sao cho nó tốt cho sức khỏe, cũng như được sự chấp nhận của cộng đồng và được sự ủng hộ của các nhà làm chuyên môn, các nhà làm y tế, bộ y tế. Thì tôi nghĩ rằng đấy là một cái sự thiệt thòi rất là lớn cho cộng đồng. Và với cái ý tưởng này, và cái ngày hôm nay chúng ta triển khai một cái hội thảo à, có thể nói là lần đầu tiên tại Việt Nam. Thì thay mặt cho lãnh đạo Bệnh viện hữu nghị Việt Đức cũng như là đơn vị đăng cai tổ chức cái hội thảo này thì tôi rất là vui mừng chào đón quý vị, các giảng viên cũng như là các bạn tham dự khoa học ngày hôm nay. Và hy vọng rằng là với sự giúp đỡ của à, Hiệp hội à, Thế giới về cái chuyên ngành chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới cũng như là À, chị của bác sĩ Khuất Thị à, à, Hải Oanh thì chúng ta sẽ có một cái sự khởi đầu à, tốt nhất có thể để cho cái tương lai gần cũng như là tương lai xa cho cộng đồng của những người mà có nhu cầu chuyển giới tại Việt Nam xin à, cảm ơn quý vị cảm ơn tất cả các giảng viên đã đến từ rất nhiều các quốc gia à, đến với chúng tôi ngày hôm nay chia sẻ kinh nghiệm cũng như là giúp đỡ chúng tôi không riêng gì ngày hôm nay và hy vọng rằng quý vị các giảng viên có thể giúp đỡ chúng tôi trong những tương lai tới đây trong nhiều năm làm sao chúng ta có thể triển khai tốt nhất ở cái việc chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới tại Việt Nam xin trân trọng cảm ơn quý vị vâng xin chân thành cảm ơn phó giáo sư tiến sĩ đồng văn hệ vì những chia sẻ vừa rồi để tiếp tục chương trình, tôi xin giới thiệu bà Esbert Ackerman, Đại sứ Vương quốc Hà Lan tại Việt Nam sẽ có những phát biểu hưởng ứng khóa tập huấn. Xin trân trọng kính mời bà. Well, good morning everybody. Xin chào and chúc mừng năm mới. Happy New Year to all of you. And um, as I said to a number of the participant, participants here this morning already, thank you very much for having me. This is really a, a very special um, meeting, gathering of uh, professionals, representatives of uh, the LGBTI and transgender community. And um, as the ambassador to the Netherlands uh, and a sponsor of uh, the pitch program, it makes me very proud that you've invited me uh, to, uh, to address you this morning. So on, uh, we have a long lasting partnership. We see each other very often but it's always great to, uh, to be part of the good works that you and your organization foster. Um, about the pitch program, let me briefly say a few words about that. Um, apart from being a proud sponsor, I think it's important to underline that we see pitch as a, a unique, one-of-a-kind program. As it, focusing, uh, as it focuses on the strengthening of the capacities of local civil society organi uh, organizations to advocate for sexual and reproductive health and rights, and at the same time uphold the human rights of key populations of which transgenders. This five-year program is implemented in nine countries worldwide, including Vietnam. The Netherlands strongly believes that everybody should be able to be who they are, both physically and mentally, so that everyone can live healthy, happily, and prosper, built on their talents. The Netherlands, therefore, urges the government and the National Assembly of Vietnam to work towards a law on transgenders that recognizes all rights of all trans people, even if they don't want to go through medical interventions or did not need or get psychological support. Meanwhile, everyone, so transgenders included, should have access to all forms of health care, so both physical and mental health care, if there is a wish or a need. Ideally, everyone should be able to use their social health insurance to, to pay for these services. It is thus very encouraging that Vietnam is working towards universal health, health coverage. It's very important to make sure that special attention is given to key populations like trans people and their sexual and reproductive health and rights. So as to ensure that all the people about whom you will be talking the next days 
have access to all forms of care. I would therefore, in line with the pitch program, make one pitch to you uh, that are present here today. Share your knowledge, share your thoughts about how to make accessible, affordable and holistic transgender health services a lived reality in Vietnam. I wish you a fruitful training, exchange of thoughts and ideas, and I do hope that you will inspire the Vietnamese authorities to deliver. Thank you very much. Xin cảm ơn. Vâng, xin cảm ơn bà Elbus Ackerman vì những lời hưởng ứng, lời chúc tốt đẹp và ý nghĩa. Vâng, kính thưa quý vị, với mong muốn hỗ trợ những nhóm cộng đồng dễ bị tổn thương nói chung và cộng đồng người chuyển giới nói riêng, trong 10 năm qua kể từ ngày thành lập, Trung tâm Hỗ trợ Sáng kiến Phát triển Cộng đồng SCDI đang trở thành một trong những địa điểm tin cậy để cộng đồng người chuyển giới Việt Nam đặt vào đó niềm tin, tâm tư, nguyện vọng trên con đường cùng tiến tới hạnh phúc. Sau đây tôi xin trân trọng, trân trọng kính mời à, bác sĩ Khuất Thị Hải Oanh, Giám đốc Trung tâm Hỗ trợ Sáng kiến Phát triển Cộng đồng SCDI sẽ có đôi lời chia sẻ. Xin trân trọng kính mời bác sĩ Khuất Thị Hải Oanh ạ. Kính thưa Phó Giáo sư Tiến sĩ Đồng Văn Hệ, Phó Giám đốc Bệnh viện Việt Đức. Kính thưa bà Elbert Ackerman, Đại sứ Vương quốc Hà Lan tại Việt Nam. Um, kính thưa các uh, giảng viên đến từ WPAT. Um, thưa tất cả các uh, anh chị học viên, thưa các quý vị. Um, Trung tâm Hỗ trợ Sáng kiến Phát triển Cộng đồng SCDI thì rất là vinh dự được uh, cùng tổ chức cái cái khóa tập huấn rất là quan trọng này à, thì uh, trung tâm uh, hỗ trợ sáng kiến phát triển cộng đồng SCDI là một tổ chức phi chính phủ của Việt Nam à, được thành lập cách đây 10 năm chúng tôi thành lập vào tháng riêng năm 2010 là bây giờ là đúng là 10 năm uh, của SCDI và trong 10 năm vừa qua thì uh, SCDI tập trung để hỗ trợ các cái nhóm yếu thế các cái nhóm ở ngoài lề xã hội và trong đó thì có cộng đồng những người chuyển những cái người uh, chuyển giới những người mà nam có quan hệ tình dục đồng giới LGBT cũng như là các cái cộng đồng mà dễ bị tổn thương khác à, trong à, những năm vừa qua thì chúng tôi có à, tham gia vào trong cái quá trình vận động để xây dựng cái luật chuyển đổi giới tính và khi mà làm việc với cộng đồng người chuyển giới tham gia vào cái quá trình xây dựng cái luật chuyển đổi giới tính thì chúng tôi thấy một điều rất là quan trọng đó là à, người chuyển giới cần phải có phải cần phải tiếp cận đến dịch vụ À, cần phải có thể tiếp cận đến dịch vụ khi mà họ cần. Hiện nay cái dịch vụ cho người chuyển giới ở Việt Nam thì gần như là không có. Cho nên là người chuyển giới à, đôi khi là phải mạo hiểm cả tính mạng, cả sức khỏe của mình để được sống làm con người như là mong muốn của mình. Cái khát vọng mà được sống làm chính mình thì với nhiều người rất là rất là khao khát, rất là mãnh liệt đến mức độ mà người ta sẵn sàng à, thậm chí là đánh đổi sức khỏe, đánh đổi à, tính mạng. À, vì thế cho nên là chúng tôi thấy rằng là chúng ta cần phải có trách nhiệm làm cho cái dịch vụ đấy nó sẵn có ở Việt Nam, nó an toàn nó có thể tiếp cận được để người ta không phải mạo hiểm trong cái quá trình mà đi tìm kiếm các cái dịch vụ đấy cũng như là không phải đánh đổi những cơ hội khác à, chúng tôi biết là người nhiều người chuyển giới thì phải làm những cái việc mà rất là mạo hiểm để mà có được À, cái tiền để mà đi ra nước ngoài để phẫu thuật hay là để mà mua hormone thì đấy là cái điều mà rất là đau lòng. À, vì thế cho nên là một trong những cái song song với cái việc là vận động chính sách à, hỗ trợ xây dựng luật chuyển đổi giới tính thì SCDI cũng tìm cái cách để mà có thể hỗ trợ để phát triển cái hệ thống dịch vụ ở Việt Nam và đấy là cái lý do mà làm sao chúng tôi à, tham gia vào tổ chức cái, cái khóa tập huấn này. À, nhưng mà cái khóa tập huấn này thì sẽ không thể nào mà diễn ra được nếu mà không có sự đồng hành của rất nhiều người um, có mặt ở đây và không có mặt ở đây. Uh, đầu tiên thì chúng tôi phải kể đến vụ pháp chế Bộ Y tế là cái cơ quan chủ trì soạn thảo cái luật chuyển đổi giới tính nhưng cũng là cái cơ quan mà rất là gần, rất là am hiểu những nhu cầu, những vấn đề của cộng đồng của người chuyển giới và thiết tha mong muốn làm sao để có được những cái cơ chế pháp luật tốt nhất, có được các cái dịch vụ tốt nhất và sẵn có nhất um, cho người chuyển giới. Chính vì thế cho nên là khi mà chúng tôi đặt vấn đề để tổ chức cái khóa học này thì vụ pháp chế Bộ Y tế rất là rất là ủng hộ. Um, một trong những cái uh, lý do nữa thôi thúc chúng tôi uh, tổ chức cái khóa học này đấy là chính là uh, cái mối liên hệ của chúng tôi với trung tâm năm học của Bệnh viện Việt Đức. Uh, thì uh, tôi với bác sĩ uh, À, phó giáo sư tiến sĩ Nguyễn Quang thì cũng là um, chỗ gọi là chị em quen biết từ ngày xưa vì là tôi cũng học ở trường y Hà Nội làm việc ở trường y Hà Nội một thời gian um, thế và có làm việc với um, một số bác sĩ ở bệnh viện Việt Đức trong đây có bác sĩ Nguyễn Quang từ 
nhiều năm trước chắc là 20 năm trước um, thì có trao đổi về vấn đề uh, của người uh, chuyển giới và uh, bác sĩ Quang thì um, uh, cũng là một trong những lãnh đạo của hội về um, y học giới tính um, của Việt Nam <cười> và giám đốc trung tâm năm học thì cũng rất là quan tâm rất là thiết tha để mà phát triển các cái dịch vụ về kỹ thuật cho người chuyển giới đấy là một cái lĩnh vực chuyên môn rất là quan trọng của y học Việt Nam um, các bác sĩ của chúng ta có thể làm được rất là nhiều um, những cái can thiệp um, rất là giỏi nhưng mà chúng ta lại chưa phát triển được cái dịch vụ này vì thế cho nên là uh, cùng với sự đồng lòng của uh, bác sĩ Quang cộng với cái sự ủng hộ của lãnh đạo bệnh viện Việt Đức uh, thì uh, uh, cái, cái cái khóa học này là được hình thành uh, tiếp đó thì phải nói đến sự cam kết rất là nhiệt tình của uh, WPAT um, là gọi là hiệp hội uh, thế giới về sức uh, của các cái nhà chuyên môn mà làm việc về uh, sức khỏe người chuyển giới um, tất cả những cái nhà chuyên môn mà làm việc về sức khỏe người chuyển giới um, ở trên thế giới thì um, uh, đều biết đến WPAT đấy là một cái tổ chức chuyên môn của các cái nhà các cái, một cái tổ chức của các cái nhà chuyên môn à, và khi mà chúng tôi liên hệ với WPAT thì WPAT rất là sẵn sàng rất là um, sẵn sàng để huy động những chuyên gia um, hàng đầu ở trên thế giới về các cái lĩnh vực liên quan đến sức khỏe của người chuyển giới um, lặn lội đi sang Việt Nam mọi người ở rất là xa ở Mỹ ở Canada bay nửa vòng trái đất sang đây để mà um, chia sẻ với chúng ta làm việc với chúng ta và hồi tháng 5 à, năm 2019 thì chúng tôi có cái hoạt động đầu tiên đấy là mời một chuyên gia um, um, từ uh, Mỹ um, là uh, bác sĩ Asa um, Radis um, uh, tham gia uh, giảng dạy ở trong cái um, cặp, uh, cái cuộc họp thường niên của Hiệp hội um, nội tiết à, Việt Nam à, thế thì à, bác sĩ Asa thì à, chúng tôi liên, lệ, liên lạc với bác sĩ Asa vì bác sĩ Asa là làm phụ trách chuyên môn cho một cái à, cơ sở à, cung cấp dịch vụ cho cộng đồng LGBT à, rất là lớn à, ở New York thì sau đó thì qua bác sĩ Asa thì mới biết là bác sĩ cũng lại là à, à, ở trong một trong cái thành phần ban lãnh đạo của hiệp hội à, WPAT và từ đó thì lần lần thế là chúng ta có cái cuộc à, À, tập huấn à, đào tạo ngày hôm nay à, Thế thì à, trong 4 ngày thì chúng tôi hy vọng là à, các à, chuyên gia sẽ cung cấp cho chúng ta các cái những cái người tham dự những cái kiến thức mà cơ bản nhất à, liên quan đến các cái khía cạnh à, quan trọng nhất của sức khỏe người chuyển giới à, chúng ta đã xem chương trình rồi à, thế và nhưng mà chúng tôi thì coi đây chỉ là bước đầu tiên chỉ là bước khởi đầu à, chúng ta có khóa hai ngày cho khóa cơ bản và hai ngày cho khóa nâng cao thế tuy nhiên thì đấy cũng mới chỉ là bước khởi đầu à, trung tâm SCDI thì muốn được đồng hành với các nhà chuyên môn ở trong cái lĩnh vực sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới à, dài lâu hơn nữa à, chiều hôm qua thì tôi có cuộc gặp với à, nhóm chuyên gia nhóm giảng viên và tôi cũng có chia sẻ cái ý định của trung tâm SCDI là đây chỉ là bước khởi đầu và thông qua cái bước khởi đầu này để chúng tôi tìm kiếm các cái hạt nhân là những cái các cái nhà chuyên môn làm việc ở trong lĩnh vực sức khỏe người chuyển giới để mà chúng tôi tiếp tục cộng tác à, à, mời à, các anh chị tạo à, hoặc là kết nối để các anh các chị tham gia vào các cái hiệp hội à, quốc tế tham gia các cái hội nghị hội thảo quốc tế hoặc là có những cái cơ hội để mà đi thực tập để đi học tập học tập về chuyên môn à, thực hành à, tham gia các cái khóa đào tạo ở nước ngoài rồi mời thêm các cái chuyên gia sang Việt Nam để mà hỗ trợ à, thì chúng tôi à, nhưng mà à, tất cả sẽ bắt đầu từ đây và coi đây là cái bước khởi đầu để tìm ra được các cái nhà chuyên môn mà có tính cam kết cao à, quan tâm đến vấn đề này để chúng ta tiếp tục hợp tác với nhau à, chúng tôi à, trong kinh nghiệm của chúng tôi thì từ khi chúng ta bắt đầu cho đến khi mà có thể xây dựng được một cái hệ thống dịch vụ chắc là ít nhất thì cũng mất khoảng phải mất khoảng 10 năm à, và trong 10 năm đó thì chúng tôi trông cậy vào à, các anh các chị ở đây là những cái hạt nhân để mà có thể phát triển cái lĩnh vực là à, chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới à, ở Việt Nam tất nhiên SCDI chỉ là một à, thành phần rất nhỏ một đối tác rất nhỏ nhưng mà chúng tôi sẽ cố gắng hết sức mình để có thể tham gia được vào trong quá trình này um, thúc đẩy cái quá trình này ở Việt Nam um, lời cuối cùng từ phía SCDI thì um, cũng không biết nói gì hơn là gửi lời cảm ơn rất là chân thành đến Bệnh viện Việt Đức À, đến uh, trung tâm uh, đào tạo của Bệnh viện Việt Đức đến trung tâm Nam Khoa của Bệnh viện Việt Đức 
um, không có um, uh, bệnh viện không có trung tâm thì chúng ta không có cái cuộc đào tạo này um, cái cuộc đào tạo này sẽ sẽ diễn ra rất là khó khăn hơn rất là nhiều um, rất là chân thành cảm ơn WPAD và các chuyên gia của WPAD. À, chúng tôi hiểu rằng là à, các vị phải rất là quan tâm, có cái sự cam kết rất là mạnh mẽ mới có thể dành thời gian quý báu à, và đi một cái quãng đường dài như vậy để đến đây. Bởi vì các chuyên gia à, hàng đầu thì chúng ta biết là thường là rất là bận rộn. Một giờ thôi cũng quý rồi, chưa kể là bỏ hẳn một cái thời gian rất là dài, cả tuần trời 10 ngày để đi sang Việt Nam để làm việc. Nên là thật sự là rất là trân trọng cái thời gian của của các quý vị. À, và à, à, cuối cùng thì à, xin một lần nữa gửi lời cảm ơn đến vụ pháp chế vì cái sự cam kết của vụ pháp chế và à, vì đã đồng, đồng hành cùng với chúng tôi. À, chúng tôi à, rất là hy vọng là các anh chị học viên sẽ dành cái cơ hội, à, tận dụng cái cơ hội này để học hỏi nhiều nhất cho mình và à, kết nối với các chuyên gia ở trên thế giới. Các anh các chị có thể thông qua các cái cơ hội này để kết nối. À, tất nhiên là anh chị nào có thể nói à, được tiếng Anh thì tốt nhất, còn nếu không thì chúng ta có à, phiên dịch, có các bạn phiên dịch có thể có thể giúp. Có hai bạn ngồi ở trong à, cái cabin kia có thể giúp à, chúng ta dịch trong à, nếu như mà các anh các chị muốn trao đổi riêng. À, Thế một lần nữa thì um, xin cảm ơn tất cả các quý vị và năm mới cũng sắp đến gần rồi. À, hy vọng là đây sẽ là một cái khóa học mà chúng ta để bắt đầu khởi đầu một năm mới, một thập kỷ mới um, rất là hạnh phúc và thành công. À, xin cảm ơn tất cả. Vâng, xin cảm ơn bác sĩ Quốc Thị Hải Oanh về những chia sẻ hết sức chân thành và gần gũi này. Vâng, xin kính thưa quý vị. Uh, sau đây tôi xin được thay mặt... Uh, Phó giáo, tiến sĩ Nguyễn Huy Quang, vụ trưởng vụ pháp chế. À, tiến sĩ Nguyễn Huy Quang à, hôm nay không có mặt ở à, khóa tập huấn của chúng ta, nhưng à, tiến sĩ Nguyễn Huy Quang có một, à, một đôi lời muốn gửi đến à, khóa tập huấn của chúng ta. Kính thưa Phó giáo sư, tiến sĩ Đồng Văn Hệ, Phó giám đốc Bệnh viện Bạch, Phó giám đốc Bệnh viện Hữu nghị Việt Đức. Kính thưa bà Esbert Ackerman, Đại sứ Vương quốc Hà Lan tại Việt Nam. Kính thưa bà Khuất Thị Hải Oanh, Giám đốc Trung tâm Hỗ trợ Sáng kiến Phát triển Cộng đồng SCDI. Thưa các học viên là các bác sĩ phẫu thuật phẫu thuật tạo hình, nội tiết, tâm thần và chuyên gia tâm lý. Thưa các quý vị đại biểu, trước hết, thay mặt tổ biên tập dự, dự án luật chuyển đổi giới tính của Bộ Y tế, tôi nhiệt liệt chào mừng và trân trọng cảm ơn Ban lãnh đạo Bệnh viện Bạch Mai, Giám đốc Trung tâm SCDI, các chuyên gia đến từ Wolfpart, Hiệp hội Chuyên gia Sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới thế giới, đã tổ chức, đã hỗ trợ để tổ chức khóa tập huấn cơ bản về sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới ngày hôm nay. Như quý vị đã biết, Hiện nay, vụ pháp chế Bộ Y tế đang chủ trì xây dựng dự án luật chuyển đổi giới tính nhằm cụ thể hóa Điều 37 của Bộ Luật Dân sự trong quá trình xây dựng dự án luật. Vụ pháp chế Bộ Y tế nhận thấy cần phải chuẩn bị đầy đủ các điều kiện về nhân lực y tế, đảm bảo tính khả thi trong đáp ứng nhu cầu của người chuyển giới sau khi luật được thông qua. Vì vậy, vụ pháp chế Bộ Y tế phối hợp với Trung tâm Hỗ trợ Sáng kiến Phát triển Cộng đồng và Bệnh viện Hữu nghị Việt Đức tổ chức khóa tập huấn cơ bản về sức khỏe của người chuyển giới với mục đích trang bị cho học viên những kiến thức cơ bản về chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới, những chăm sóc ban đầu, phẫu thuật, liệu pháp nội tiết và sức khỏe tâm thần, xây dựng kỹ năng nâng cao về lập kế hoạch và tài liệu hóa trong quá trình hỗ trợ chăm sóc sức khỏe người chuyển giới, xây dựng mạng lưới. Các nhà cung cấp dịch vụ chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới làm nền tảng để phát triển hệ thống dịch vụ y tế đáp ứng nhu cầu của người chuyển giới tại Việt Nam. Khóa tập huấn sẽ được đào tạo bởi các chuyên gia đến từ Hiệp hội Chuyên gia Sức khỏe cho Người Chuyển giới Thế giới, một tổ chức hàng đầu trong việc chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới. Tôi hy vọng rằng với khóa tập huấn này sẽ mang lại nhiều kiến thức bổ ích cho các bác sĩ và chuyên gia tâm lý. Các anh chị sẽ tham gia tích cực, đầy đủ khóa học và sau khóa học tập huấn này. Các bác sĩ và chuyên gia ngồi đây sẽ là những giảng viên nguồn, những máy cái để có thể truyền đạt kiến thức, kinh nghiệm của mình cho các thế hệ đi sau. Một lần nữa, Thay mặt tổ biên tập dự án luật chuyển đổi giới tính, tôi xin cảm ơn Bệnh viện Hữu nghị Việt Đức, Trung tâm SCDI đã hỗ trợ cả tài chính, kỹ thuật để tổ chức khóa tập huấn này. Chúc khóa tập huấn của chúng ta thành công rực rỡ và nhân dịp Tết đến xuân về, tôi xin gửi lời kính chúc sức khỏe, hạnh phúc và bình an tới các quý vị đại biểu, các bác sĩ, đặc biệt là các chuyên gia đến từ Hiệp hội Chuyên gia về Sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới thế giới, đến từ nước Mỹ xa xôi đã đến đây để hỗ trợ cho người chuyển giới tại Việt Nam. Kính chúc các quý vị một năm mới vạn sự như ý. Vâng, sau đây tôi xin kính mời bà Susan O'Sullivan, đại diện Hiệp hội Chuyên gia Sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới thế giới sẽ có đôi lời chia sẻ về khóa tập huấn. Xin kính mời bà. Hello, 
on behalf of um, WPATH and our board of directors and all of our um, fantastic trainers that we have here, we sincerely want to thank you for this opportunity. It's, it's um, just such an honor to be invited here, to be able to be a part of helping um, Vietnam um, meet the needs for um, health care for transgender people. Um, WPATH, I think, as you know, our um, mission is to promote evidence-based care, um, education, research, advocacy, public policy, and respect in transgender health. And that's what we're here to, um, to help to, um, for people in the audience to help to understand. We have um, professionals from across the um, medical professions that will be working to train in various um, areas um, throughout the next few days. We're, um, as I said, we're really, really excited to be part of this. I want to thank the organizers for reaching out to WPATH and inviting us, and also thanks to, um, to WPATH um, staff, um, Blaine Vela, who is the deputy, deputy director for WPATH, as well as Taylor O'Sullivan, who is the educational program um, um, coordinator. If you have questions um, throughout the whole this week, please come and see us. Um, as staff, we can help with introductions and help to answer any questions that you might have. Um, it's our vision as WPATH to see a world wherein people of all gender identities, gender expression, have an express have access to health care, social services, justice, and equality. Um, we're here to, to hopefully help make a difference for Vietnam. I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about the Global Education Initiative, which started as an um, initiative from our board of directors. And then in 2016, we started training globally. Um, this was part of a vision of our co-chairs, Dr. Lynn Frazier and Dr. Gail Knudsen, as um, leading the Global Education Initiative. I'd like to invite them up to, um, to start us off and do um, we have, a, we have a couple little comments from, from them as our leaders here. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much uh, for having us here. We are honored to be here in, in Vietnam. And, and happy new year and happy, oh, yeah. happy decade. Happy new decade. Um, <laughs> My name is Gail Knutson, and I'm a clinical uh, professor at medicine in um, Vancouver from the University of British Columbia. And I'm the immediate past president of WPATH and, and co chair of the Global Education Initiative with Lynn. Do you want to introduce yourself yes. in this? And I'm Dr. Lynn Fraser. I'm also a past president of WPATH and co chair with Dr of the Global Education Initiative. And we are thrilled. Thank you. Thank you. We are thrilled to be here. I look at all of you out in our audience to take four days of your valuable time to come and learn with us. We see this as a conversation where we'll be learning together although we probably have a bit more time in the field. I've been working in the field for 40 years, long time. And we feel so wonderful. You have welcomed us so beautifully, Dr. Wang, um, Kim, Zoom, Mai, all of you last night, we learned a lot about uh, what your hopes are and we hope we can fulfill them. So thank you. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our faculty um, that is here this morning. Um, you'll meet more as uh, the days go on because some are still flying in. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Asa Radix, if he could just stand up and wave. <laughs> He's from uh, New York. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ren Massey is from the Atlanta area. <laughs> Dr. Josh Safer, who is uh, from New York. Uh, Dr. Steve Rosenthal, who's from Los Angeles. Uh, Dr. Fred Etner, who is from Chicago. 
uh, Dr. Randy Etner, who's from Chicago. So welcome. And, and uh, we will, uh, there are still some faculty coming and we will be introducing them to you um, as the program continues. One thing we want you all to know is throughout the four days, we all will be available to answer questions at breaks, during lunch. Um, sometimes you may have a question that you may not be have time or whatever in the larger group. Please come up to any of us. Exchange cards. We are here for you. Um, in terms of our introduction, uh, one of the um, people that we wanted to uh, really thank uh, for being here and for making this happen um, are the people from SCDI. And um, we also like to thank the leadership from Viet Duc uh, Hospital for, for having us. Um, uh, Ambassador, I'm very honored that you're here and thank you for your support. And so at this point, uh, we'd like to ask Dr. Wine to come up from SCDI and we'd like to present you with a plaque from WPATH and thank you so much for um, uh, honoring us with um, helping you with your uh, directive with key populations. And secondly, um, we would like to uh, recognize um, Asia Pacific Trans Network um, because we have been uh, fortunate uh, to work with them on different projects. Um, Dr. Radix is here and he was the co-author of um, the Asia Pacific Trans Network uh, Blueprint. Um, uh, they're the guidelines that uh, are used in um, Asia. Um, and uh, we have done, uh, been involved in other projects with them, such as the Lancet uh, series, and that's one of the first places that I met uh, Joe Wong, who is the director of Asia Pacific Trans Network. I'm not sure, is Joe here, here or is Cole here? Oh, there you I'm are. Oh, okay. Uh, so <laughs> please, uh, if you would please come and accept um, our offer of thanks uh, mm -hmm. for uh, your support of this project and including us in this project and, and we very much um, are honored to uh, work with you. So thank you so much, Joe. You've helped us so much <laughs> as we prepared. We can't say enough. So here you go. Um, so, uh, before we go on to the next uh, part of the program, which will be introducing um, the Global Education Initiative, um, we would like to uh, uh, invite uh, the faculty and people that were uh, the uh, directors that were doing the introductory remarks up for a photo, please. Thank you. Vâng, xin cảm ơn các chuyên gia đến từ Worldpad đã có những chia sẻ rồi ạ. Vâng, xin kính mời tất cả các chuyên gia cùng uh, các và các uh, tham dự viên chúng ta sẽ cùng uh, tiến lên sân khấu để chụp một kiểu ảnh lưu niệm ạ.
vâng xin cảm ơn tất cả các anh chị ạ kính thưa quý vị khóa tập huấn cơ bản về chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới sẽ diễn ra trong 4 ngày từ ngày 14 đến ngày 17 tháng 1 tại bệnh viện hữu nghị việt đức với sự tham gia chia sẻ của các tiến sĩ bác sĩ chuyên gia về chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới trong ngày hôm nay và ngày mai 14 15 tháng 1 chúng ta sẽ được cung cấp các kiến thức cơ bản về chăm sóc sức khỏe cho người chuyển giới ngày 16 tháng 1 chúng ta sẽ có cơ hội tham gia tập huấn nâng cao về y tế sức khỏe tâm môn thần và tập huấn nâng cao về trẻ em và, và vị thành niên ngày 17 tháng 1 chúng ta sẽ trao đổi sâu hơn về lập kế hoạch và tài liệu và tài liệu hóa và tập huấn nâng cao về các vấn đề đạo đức Vâng, trước khi đến với những nội dung của tập huấn ngày hôm nay thì ban tổ chức có một thông báo nhỏ đến các tham dự viên vì lý do Bệnh viện Việt Đức hôm nay có lịch kiểm tra đột xuất từ Bộ Y tế nên ngày hôm nay chương trình tập huấn của chúng ta sẽ kết thúc sớm hơn dự kiến vào lúc 16 giờ và ban tổ chức và nhóm giảng viên sẽ bố trí thời gian dành cho thảo luận trường hợp vào các ngày tập huấn tiếp theo và đảm bảo đầy đủ các nội dung tập huấn. Ban tổ chức rất mong sẽ nhận được sự thông cảm và hợp tác đến từ các tham dự viên ạ. Vâng, và để bắt đầu những nội dung của buổi tập huấn ngày hôm nay, tôi xin kính mời bác sĩ Lynn Fraser, thạc sĩ tư vấn gia đình, tiến sĩ giáo dục và bác sĩ Gail Nuxon, bác sĩ, thạc sĩ giáo dục, thành viên Hiệp hội Bác sĩ Đại học Hoàng gia, đại diện tổ chức World Press sẽ có bài trình bày về sáng kiến giáo dục toàn cầu. Xin kính mời bác sĩ ạ. Um, Gail and I are going to talk for the next 15 or 20 minutes about the Global Education Initiative. And I am, I'll be interested in terms of, thank you so much for having a translator, of when the, when the translator will be talking in terms of what is up there. So if we're not saying the same thing at all, I may be on the, a different slide. Could you let me know, those of you who are bilingual? Because I don't know. Um, at any rate, again, as we were saying, we're so happy to be here. And what we want to talk about in the next few minutes is just to introduce you to the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, to talk about our standards of care, to talk about our global education initiative. And typically, we have a two-day agenda, but today, but here we have a four-day agenda. And I'm not sure what you translated, but I see two-day, but it's four-day. So who are we? What is the organization that is here to work with you? Um, we're the only global association devoted solely to the health care of transgender and gender nonconforming people. We develop and publish the standards of care. I believe you have received a copy of the standards of care. Is that correct? No. In Vietnamese? You have, there's an online Vietnamese uh, standards of care, which you can find. We'll get you the link. We, our organization was founded in 1979, and we have over 3,000 medical, mental health, education, legal, and other professional members, all of whom are engaged in research and clinical practice affecting the lives of trans people. And we encourage all of you to join us, maybe uh, during the time we're here together to talk with uh, our admin staff. Um, we would welcome you to be part of our organization. What is our mission? Am I matching? No, it's not. Oh, here it is over here, but that's in English. Are you putting it in Vietnamese? Or is somebody be translating or not? That, I don't think that's it. Let's see. Mission and vision. Keep going. And maybe I can, is there some way to, I, how many people speak English? Okay, so I want to make sure that someone is translating. Or that we have a... I'm afraid I can't. Okay, there. There, ah, there it is. Okay. Okay, so I was... Uh, maybe, do you want to go 
backwards? So will someone be able to? <laughs> it's happening now? No, here? It's working, okay. All right, I was talking about WPATH and our mission and vision. And our mission is to promote evidence-based care, education, research, advocacy, public policy, and respect in trans health. And respect is very important. And what our vision is, is, and that is why we are here, is we envision a world where people of all gender identities and gender expressions have access to evidence-based healthcare, social services, justice, and equality. Does that make sense? So how did WPATH begin? What was it like in 1979 when we started? And I think there are some parallels to what we experience here in Vietnam. Not completely, you're more progressive here, but back, in the, back then, there was no knowledge, and I'm talking about now in the United States, uh, in Western Europe. There was a lack of respectability, and we did have a gender clinic, but they closed it because the belief was that transsexuality was a mental illness. And so surgery would be harmful. Some of the treatments, the treatments that you're learning would be harmful. And also there were people doing surgery, but they were doing them on demand. They were unethical. They were doing them in like a garage. So we needed, okay, moving on. Is this standards of care? No, maybe one, it's here, it's right. That doesn't look like it's it. Okay, there it is, okay. So what happened was the organization developed a standards of care that you have access to that are guidelines for the treatment and management and working with trans people. And that's what we will be working, we'll be training from the standards of care in the next four days. We've gone through seven iterations. And this is what it looks like. Here. So the history of, the, of our field, it came through what's called a sex change model. Everyone who was transgender, what the belief was is they would move from one sex to another. And today, we believe there are, all, there are many, there's a gender spectrum, multiple gender identities, not just male and female. But initially, there, it was a sex, what's called a sex change model. And how we have learned, we have learned so much because the community has gotten involved and through the internet, we have so much more knowledge. But it's still true that due to marginalization, the population is more vulnerable than the non-trans population. And some of our earlier speakers addressed that. Now we're concerned with the overall health of trans people and what we'll be doing over the next four days is we'll be talking about multiple disciplines, multiple issues of health care. And we recognize that trans people as a vulnerable population um, have other issues that are uh, such as tobacco use, alcohol use, trauma that are uh, more there's more of it in the trans population than in non-trans populations. So what's, what is important, and this is something that is very important for all of us to understand, is that the tone in which, in the standards of care and the way in which we interact with our trans people is very important. 
In the standards of care, there's a clear statement that gender nonconformity is not pathological. So being trans is not a disease. It's not pathological. It's a condition. Okay. Is this working? Sorry. No, help me. And also that psychotherapy is not a necessity, but it's recommended. The new standards of care are more evidence-based. There, it, it was a, there was a five-year process of going through with experts from around the world putting together the standards, and we have many, many uh, evidence-based references in the back of the standards of care for you to take a look at. And now I want to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Gail. You're welcome. In terms of the standards of care, we have 19 um, current translations, and we and uh, the most recent one is, was uh, in is in Polish, and uh, we have Dr. Uh, Radox here. Um, who actually is co-chair of the Standards of Care version 8, which will be coming out shortly. Um, our, the, other two, uh, the other chair is Dr. John Arcelis, um, who is from the University of Nottingham, and Eli Coleman, uh, who is the chair, and he is from University of Minnesota. Um, Dr. Coleman was the uh, chair for Standards of Care version 7. As Lynn said, uh, this is going to be a different document in that it's evidence-based and we have um, um, the services or hired the services of an evidence-based medicine team from uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, in terms of the Global Education Initiative, uh, we have now trained well over 3,000 people uh, over the last three years. Um, most of the trainings have been done in the United States, where the majority of our members lie. Uh, we also have a large number of members in Canada. Uh, we've done two trainings there. And the other large population uh, bases are in uh, Europe, and we have done a training in Amsterdam. And um, in terms of uh, uh, other countries, we're here in Vietnam, uh, we were in uh, Buenos Aires, so um, uh, also in Kyrgyzstan, and there was recently uh, one of our trainers was in, in Poland, and uh, uh, just with the recent version of the standards of care. So uh, we're very much uh, interested in learning and working with uh, people uh, globally in terms of increasing access to care uh, with respect to transgender health. Um, we uh, train on these four competency domains and these were uh, these were uh, produced by people that were part of a team that um, were international uh, education experts, and so they came from different um, areas of the world, and they and uh, looked at um, different um, types of education models. And so, when we're going through the training, we're going through. Uh, they're all based on these, not only the standards of care version seven, but in these competency domains. Um, in terms of looking at our uh, global education initiative, one of our initiatives within the next year is to have more, uh, to have online training. And uh, what we've been doing is uh, filming some of our recent um, courses so that we will be able to have them online. Um, there is a course that is going to be released in uh, this month or next month. We have a partnership with um, the with WHO with the Pan American um, 
group of, or division of WHO, and we're doing an online transgender health training, and that will be available on the, um, uh, it's called the PAHO Online University for people to take uh, free in terms of uh, uh, continuing education credits. Uh, if people are interested in um, joining WPATH or uh, are taking further courses, uh, I'm going to shout out to Taylor here. Um, she's in charge, she's our education programmer, uh, coordinator, if you want to see her. <laughs> uh, in terms of transgender health uh, becoming more globally recognized, in 2016 there was a Lancet series that came out and WPATH members were um, involved in this. Um, as I was saying, Joe was involved in this as well, as, many, as well as many other people from around the world. And this really put uh, transgender health on a global stage. And so, um, we're hoping uh, by being here that um, that we can um, uh, share uh, some of our knowledge and learn from you and um, increase access to care in um, in this region. Uh, the two the four areas that we're looking at in this training in terms of global uh, gender affirmation are social um, areas of gender affirmation psychological or mental health, the third one is medical, and the fourth one is legal. So we'll be focusing on all these four areas over the four days. So thank you, and at this time, um, I'd like to call up uh, Dr. Ren Massey, who is uh, a board member of WPATH. He's the past president of the Georgia, Georgia Psychological Association. He's uh, on faculty at uh, Emory University, and um, he uh, is a faculty and member of the Global Education Initiative, and he's going to give our introduction to trans health. Dr. Massey, thank you. All right, so we will be talking about some terminology and some ideas that are essential to transgender health care. And we'll also talk a little bit about the competency framework that WPATH uses in training healthcare professionals. In North America and in many countries, we have this narrative or set of ideas that most of us are trained to believe in our biology classes, by our families, by our religions, our organizations. In summary, if somebody at birth appears to have a penis, they are assigned a male gender marker. And they have been assumed to grow into a male gender identity. And then they are assumed to use and display masculine gender expression. And then part of that natural set of assumptions is that these people who are labeled males will be attracted to females or women. Similarly, if a person at birth, a baby appears to have a vagina, that person will be labeled female and assumed to grow into a woman and to use feminine gender expression and then to be attracted to males. I call this a ladder of assumptions. We are going to examine this ladder of assumptions because there are some problems with it. So let us first start with looking at sex. Sex is actually biological and is terminology, male or female, used to describe and based on external genitalia. Again, typically assigned at birth, a legal marker or assignment is made at birth. None of us get asked. It is done to us. It also includes chromosomes. 
and reproductive structures and hormones and secondary sex characteristics. Those are all biology and have to do with sex and anatomy. When I started studying this area, it was very helpful for me to learn that there were actually people outside what we call the binary. There are people who are not just male or just female. There are people who have intersex conditions, which are also called disorders of sex development or differences of sex development. Many in the field prefer the term differences of sex development because it reflects that variation is natural in biology. We have different hair colors, different heights. Some are shorter, some are taller. Some of us are wider, some of us are skinnier. We have different kinds of hair. Variation is normal. Some examples of variations that can lead to differences in reproductive structures or in genitalia are hormonal variations. So complete or partial androgen insensitivity syndrome can lead to the masculinization, the feminization, excuse me, the feminization of someone who has XY chromosomes. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia can lead to the masculinization of someone with XX chromosomes. Similarly, there are chromosomal conditions like Klinefelter's where there can be multiple X's and a Y chromosome or Turner syndrome where there's an X and a blank. So these are just a few variations that lead to differences in biological presentation. So biology even is not as binary, male or female, is not as simple as we think. So now we're going to talk about some ideas about gender. Identity is a term that has come up in recent years because we needed to talk about how people experience their own sense of their gender. All of us have an inner sense of being male or female or something else. It is our internal sense of our gendered self. So examples of gender identities are people who are transgender. Transgender individuals do not feel that their gender identity that they experience internally matches the gender marker assigned to them at birth. Does everybody understand what I'm saying there? Follow? Yes? Transgender is an umbrella term. It includes very many different kinds of ways people's gender identity may not match the gender assigned at birth, the marker assigned at birth, the legal marker. Cisgender refers to most people. Cisgender refers to people whose gender identity that they experience inside and in here matches the gender marker assigned at birth. We have another term, non-transgender, because there are some people who do not identify with transgender. They feel that term doesn't define them accurately. And they may identify as agender or non-binary. I will say more about that in a little bit. Kindy Nguyen is an example of an out transgender man in Vietnam. Very strong. We also see transgender people across many countries and many cultures. In the top left, 
We good? In the top left is Cecilia Chung, an American born Chinese woman who is an activist who went through some very difficult times living on the streets as a transgender woman and managed to get her education and become an activist for transgender issues in America. In the bottom left is Angela Ponce. She was the representative of Miss Spain in 2018 for the Miss Universe contest. And she is another transgender woman. In the top middle is Xi Jing, the first woman officially to transition in China in the 1990s. In the bottom right is Isis King, who is an actress and a model. And in the top right is Lana Wachowski of the Wachowski sisters, who used to be the Wachowski brothers. Both Lana and her sibling transitioned, male to female. They were directors of many fine movies and films and TV shows. You may have heard of the Matrix movies. They made the Matrix movies. So before I go further, I want to tell you a little about how I got into this field. When I completed my doctorate in 1989, I did not plan to work in transgender health. There was not a lot going on in the United States in transgender health care then. But I was born in 1962. So I'm 57, I'll do the math for you. <laughs> and I was very interested in a number of things going on in the 1960s and 70s. There were many protests against the war with Vietnam. There were protests against the oppression of black people in the United States. And also in the United States, there were protests against the rules for women. There were problems, a lot of the people felt that the rules for women and girls were not fair. And in some ways it suggested the rules for boys and men were not fair. I was very interested in these protests against the rules for women and girls because I was raised a girl. I was assigned a female gender marker at birth. I was very lucky because my parents even though they were very conservative, they thought it was cute that I'd like to do a lot of boy things. In America, we have a term called tomboy. I like to play with cars and trucks and ride bikes with the boys and play football. I did not act like other little girls. But Back in 1970, I remember telling a kid, another child, I wanted to be a boy, but I didn't know that that was a possibility. And so I just tried to make the most of things. I tried to enjoy my life. And mostly that was fine until I got a little older. And then there was more social pressure at school and at home to start to act more of a girl. That was not comfortable for me. Imagine this person having to go into the girl's bathroom or the girl's locker room in school. I was very uncomfortable but I didn't know a word for it. We didn't have Google back then. So I tried to get along and I tried to 
become more feminine. I grew my hair long. By the time I was in college, my hair was in the middle of my back. But the other thing I started realizing was that I was attracted to girls. And that was not a thing that was talked about either back then. And so I just thought, I guess I'm a lesbian, but I won't talk about that because people were not talking about that back then. And then eventually in college, I met my first girlfriend. It was very secretive, which made it very stressful. But I knew that I didn't like boys. I didn't want to date boys. So as I got older and then went to graduate school, I started meeting more people who were gay or lesbian. And so I eventually came out as a lesbian, which is kind of funny with this face. Over the years, that was in my 20s that I came out as a lesbian. Over the years, I became more and more masculine. And my hair got shorter and shorter and shorter. By the time I was in my 40s, I looked very masculine, but and I would wear suits, but still people saw me as a woman. Now let me tell you, when I came out as a lesbian, remember I said my parents were very conservative? It was cute to be a tomboy, not cute to be a lesbian. So we had stress, we had conflict. It took a long time for my parents to adjust to my being a lesbian. I eventually was in a place in my 40s where my life was calm. I had an established practice as a psychologist. My colleagues respected me. I worked a lot in the organization, the Georgia Psychological Association, GPA. And I knew many people. I had a partner a woman I was with for 10 years. My stepdaughter was nearly finished with college. My health was good. My parents had come to some adjustment, some peace about my being a lesbian. And I realized that there was still something wrong, still something missing in me. I felt some depression and some anxiety. But the words are not strong enough to tell you how profound, how deep, how severe the depression and anxiety were. I had to start reading around and meeting people to try to find out what was going on. And I finally encountered more information on transgender issues. And I thought, ah, this may be what I need to think about. And I thought, oh, this may be something I need to think about. I did not want to be transgender. I already came out once as a lesbian. I don't want to have to come out again. I went to my own counselor. I did a lot of prayer. I did a lot of meditation. I did a lot of journaling. And I talked to my close friends who I trusted most. And I gathered more information and realized that I could not escape the truth, that I needed to be more and more masculine. And every step I took to become more masculine, I felt better. 
And as I felt better, I would take another step and another step. And so I transitioned. I happen to be binary and identify as a male. Not everybody wants to transition to male or to female, but I needed to become a man. And now my life is so much better. Not just because sometimes things are easier for men, but because it is right for me. I don't feel a fight inside of me, a conflict inside of me. I don't feel shame. And I will tell you the challenging thing about being transgender, one of the many things, is that if you are going to stay where you live, you have to tell everybody. If I wanted to move far away and start a whole new life, in secret I could do that, but I did not want to lose my friends, my relationships, my colleagues. So I had to tell everybody that I was transitioning, my neighbors, my doctors, my colleagues, all of my patients, and of course, my partner and my family. A lot of people. I was very fortunate because for the most part, I was met with a lot of love. I tried to give a lot of love as I came out to people and I received much love in return. With my colleagues, other psychologists in Georgia, they had known that I had done a lot of work with them before in the association, the GPA. And they asked me to chair the annual conference. So I worked very hard because I did not want to be the first transgender person and fail as the conference chair. And the conference was very successful, sold out, and so they asked me to run for president in 2012. I said no thank you. I had only started my transition in 2010. So I was a baby. I needed to mature and grow into this. But they asked me again in 2016. And in 2016, I said yes. I was willing to be the president of the Georgia Psychological Association. And what I am so excited about is that they gave me so many opportunities to learn and to grow taking on such an important and demanding role. They gave me opportunities to meet new people, to represent our organization and psychology at the state legislature and the national legislature in Washington, D.C. They trusted me to work toward the good of our profession and the mental health of the people in the state of Georgia. I was very humbled and honored to do that work. It's one of the best professional experiences of my life. And I can tell you that I never would have felt like doing it before in my prior incarnation. That is how I think of it when I was a woman. Because I know now a part of me was always at war with myself. I did not know why, but I was never at peace. And once I transitioned to become the man I was supposed to be, it freed up so much energy and so much ability. And I tell this story when I talk to schools and to parents because I see so many people who do more and more things and are so much happier 
once they transition. And I'm not depressed. I'm not anxious now. I'm happy. Very happy. The hardest part to talk about is my family. Because I thought if we had fights when I was a lesbian, I thought they would reject me, cut me off. And so I wrote letters to them to try to explain about being transgender and to tell them I loved them and hoped that they would still be able to love me and understand and eventually grow with me as this person who was becoming their son and their brother. And I don't know. I will never forget the phone call from my mother who said, and my parents were in their 70s, much older. My mother said, your father had to go do something, but he said to say, hello, son. And that was before I had any surgery that was before I had any hormones. It was so powerful. And it still means this much to me at 57. So that was back around 2010. And my My parents both passed away. They died in 2017. One of the greatest blessings of my life is they got to know me as their son. The gift is priceless. And all the conflicts we had before are gone. Very peaceful. So our last years together were very peaceful and loving. And they really understood me. In fact, it's kind of funny because all those binary expectations with that ladder of expectations, it worked for me. Because now, instead of being a woman who is breaking all the rules, I was just a man doing typical man things. So I will tell you more stories about my life as we continue, but I want to talk now about other ways of being transgender or non-transgender. There, in America, we have terms like gender expansive. And there, not everybody wants to transition male to female or female to male. So we have terms like gender non-conforming, gender variant, non-binary, gender non-binary, gender queer. These are people who do not identify with being male or female. Gender fluid people may feel more male at some times and more female at other times. They may flow back and forth within a day or within a week. People who are transmasculine or feminine may feel somewhat like they are masculine or somewhat feminine. But again, not needing fully to transition, they may or may not want hormone care or surgery. Cross-dressing are people who 
Usually, it is a label for males assigned at birth who dress in female attire sometimes. There are many people who live part-time, so they can go to work in one set of clothes and come home and relax and be themselves in another set of clothes or with their friends. They may have to do this to keep their job or while their children grow up or until they get out of the house and are no longer living with their parents. There are even people who want to be more neutral, male to eunuch or female to neutois, and may want their secondary sex characteristics neutralized or their gonads neutralized surgically or chemically. So we need to understand there are many ways of not being cisgender. So we talked a little about different gender identities. Now we're going to talk about gender roles. These are the roles ascribed or the, to each gender. The, I will intentionally use this slide because many of the roles and rules are binary. We have rules, usually, that men are supposed to be one way and women are another way. These rules and roles can be enforced by schools, by teachers, family, friends, peers, organizations, and more. In addition to our gender role, we may express our gender in unique ways. Even within a gender, we may have unique ways of being gendered. And so, this is my favorite slide that is going to come up. Our patterns of expression in our dress, our grooming, our mannerisms, our voice, and behavior. So, mm. It won't behave. Ah. This is how we each do our gender. And it may be defined by our hobbies or our clothes, our hairstyles, etc. For example, my main hobby is partner dancing. In America, it's very popular to take lessons with somebody, usually the opposite sex, but not always. Again, it's kind of a binary activity, but I really enjoy partner dancing. And I take the usual male role of leading. So that is part of my gender expression. So another part of gender expression is, has been assumed to have to do with sexual orientation. Finally, and when we look at sexual orientation, we need to understand this is different than gender identity. Sexual orientation has to do with who we're attracted to, who we are sexually aroused by, and it usually refers to the preferred partner. Now, I have this slide because I work with many young people. And the parents bring them to me and say, can't my child just be gay? This makes me laugh because in the 1990s when I started my practice, that would not have been OK. That would have been bad. Now in America, being gay is not a big deal for most people. Some people still, it's difficult, but for many people, it's not a big deal. So the parents ask, can't they just be gay? And I explain, you can be cisgender, comfortable that your identity matches your gender marker, and you can be gay, lesbian, straight or heterosexual, bisexual, pansexual, polysexual, etc. Guess what? You can also be transgender 
and be all those things. I know transgender men who look like me and they are attracted to men. So they are gay transgender men. I used to be a lesbian, now I'm a straight man, heterosexual, because I still like women. You can also be gender non-binary and be bisexual, pansexual, polysexual. I have the question marks because if attraction is based on who you're attracted to and your gender identity and you're really non-binary, can you be gay or lesbian or straight? Just something to think about. So when we look at sexual orientation, we need to understand people may have attractions, but their behavior may not always match up. There are men who are married to women, but who have sex with men in secret. And sometimes this is a high risk for HIV. There are sometimes people who have vows of celibacy and do not act on it because they have for religious reasons, decided not to be sexual. They also may not identify with a community, like the gay community. They may still identify as heterosexual. So when we go back to this narrative, this ladder of assumptions, what we see is that actually one is biology, one is the inner experience of gender identity, Gender expression can be very varied and playful, and sexual attraction may not depend on how people are uh, identified as their gender either. So in reality, the arrows can go all sorts of ways. When we are treating transgender people, we need to be aware that there are as Dr. Knudsen said, the four areas of domains of gender affirmation from the Lancet article. There's the social affirmation with pronouns, names, and presentation. There's the psychological affirmation, people's sense of self, their authentic ability to be themselves, and access to good mental health care, psychologists, psychotherapists, psychiatrists. Good medical care, like hormone treatment, but also other medical care and surgical care, primary care, fertility concerns, as well as legal care and the ability to have autonomy and the right to define themselves based on their identity, not based on surgery or hormones, and to change their name and their gender marker on their legal documents. Transgender people need the right to decide what elements of care they need for themselves. In WPATH, the competency of domains, the areas we are concerned about for healthcare providers have to do with knowledge, skills, and cultural awareness in the areas of the caregiver and care receiver relationship, interdisciplinary practice, content knowledge, and professional responsibilities. We start with a caregiver receiver relationship because that is so important. I'm not going to go over all this. You hopefully have this information and it will be translated and accessible to you but there is knowledge and skills and awareness you need to have to have a good relationship that is respectful. But I will emphasize that working with this population, we underscore dignity and respect because this population has encountered so much negativity, marginalization and oppression. So transgender and gender non-conforming people also we need to remember may be healthcare providers like me. 
They may be coworkers. They may be community leaders. They may be family members. I have a stepdaughter. I have grandchildren. I have brothers and sister. And I had my parents until they passed. I have nephews and nieces. We always want to follow the lead of a person who is presenting to us and honor their name and their pronouns regardless of their legal status, their gender marker, their medical history, or their appearance. And we always want to speak about transgender people as if they are in the room. Because most, many transgender people, if you say something negative and they hear it, they will be afraid to talk to you. So regardless of why somebody comes for care, whether it's to transition or if it's because they have an emergency. I have Crohn's disease. There are things people get treatments for that are not about transgender issues. And they need respect and dignity. When it is about gender, we want health care providers to know that not everybody is male or female, that there is gender nonconformity, diversity. We want you to have competence and to have sensitivity in providing this care. As providers, all of us have been influenced by the culture we live in. We need to look at, and it takes courage and strength to grow our minds, to be aware that we have been influenced by our culture to think in very binary ways and to start thinking outside of the binary and other experiences. We also want to be aware of our power and privilege. As healthcare professionals, we have education. We have power to give people access to care mental health care, hormone care, surgery, or other care. People are, may be afraid to come to us and talk to us, so we need to be very sensitive and warm and embracing. Huang, Huang at the Gender Justice Program Coordinator at the Vietnam Institute for Studies of Society and Economy and Environment was quoted in an article saying that about three to five percent of Vietnam's population identifies as non-heterosexual LGBTQI. In a survey in 2019 with ISCE and with the group, it's Tea Time, right? Uh, there was a study that found there were nearly 500,000 transgender people in Vietnam. That's about 5% of the population. This was a, an initial study, but we think that there are probably more. Like the director said earlier today, it may be more like 1%, which is what we're seeing in many Western studies. So that means around a million people in Vietnam who are transgender. Huang and Osterhof did a large study in 2016 using a Facebook group with over 1,500 transgender men. And now I understand they have over 5,000 members on that Facebook group. Many of the people in this study were transgender men, like me, because they had computer access a smaller percentage were transgender women. Most of them were, were kin. So here's the percentages who answered the online survey. Many again were the men who did the online survey about livelihoods. And the, then there were in-depth interviews that were half men and half women. One of the big problems they found was 
not matching identification cards. That more of the women had changed their appearance and had changed their cards, but it's a problem for changing their cards because if you do not have an ID card that matches you, how are you going to apply for your education, for a job, to travel by airplane, or otherwise go to the hospital, or get married, or get admitted to state buildings? The law currently says that at 14, citizens have to go to the local authority and get their ID card. But there is not allowance that helps it be easier for transgender people when it changes. My understanding is that only folks, people in the prisons and the rehab centers, rehab education centers, and people with mental disorders may not have cards. So you are labeled if you do not have an ID card. People need a way to be able to change their sex gender marker and their names. Not many people even know that they can change their names. In the United States, there was a major survey done about five years ago. And I only reference this because if you want to look it up, you can. But what we find is there are many things that were true in the US survey as we find in Vietnam. For example, there are education obstacles in the United States as well as in Vietnam. About 17% of the students in the United States schools left because of being bullied and picked on, attacked physically, attacked sexually, attacked verbally made to wear the wrong uniforms, wear the wrong, go to the wrong bathroom. And the same thing happened in Vietnam, the same numbers, because about 80% report being picked on. And so 17% leave school because the harassment and bullying is so bad. These are the ones indicating how much they've been bullied. When we think about people being bullied and leaving school, that is going to affect their ability to earn a job, to have sources of income, to be able to have a living and to save money. Many of the people said they did not have full-time work. Only a fourth of the transgender men had full-time work and less than that of the women had full-time work. Less than half had part-time work. Some had their own business, a small number. Many depended on family and friends for their money. Less than half had enough for their own needs. Very few were able to save. Over half said they did not have enough for their own needs and a quarter said they had no job. These are Vietnamese statistics. It's very similar to the United States statistics, where many more people who are transgender live in poverty or have unemployment who are transgender. In the study, many people who were transgender and working were motivated to work and to prove their value to the family, but there was no legal protection for hiring or for job promotions or for keeping jobs. This has to do with an idea called intersectionality. This brings us to a term that came up from a black feminist, an African-American feminist scholar at Stanford University, who talks about how our many identities intersect. So if, as a 
man in America who is perceived as heterosexual and cisgender, I have a great deal of privilege and safety. But for people who do not blend in well, they may not have the same experience. I also have a great deal of education, so I have a different experience. So we need to recognize that different identities, education, race, ethnicity, religion, social class, are going to be affecting people's job opportunities and their experiences and their potential risk for violence and mistreatment. We cannot be ethical in our work if we do not understand this concept that it's very complicated and we have to understand that it can be harder and harder for people who have more ways of being marginalized or oppressed in the population. And as providers, again, we hold a lot of power with education and resources. We need to understand that people who come to see us may be scared. They may be angry that they have to come to us. And we want to be helpful to help them feel accepted and safe. We need to understand that a trans woman may end up doing sex work because she didn't get a job, because she didn't finish her education, because she was so bullied and beaten up in school. So we have health concerns. We need to know that some trans men are forced to marry or maybe sexually assaulted. We need to recognize they may not be able to get an education or a job again with no ID card. They may be turned away from doctor's offices. We don't want your offices to be that way. We want you to make a difference in, in Vietnam. This slide is here, the black bars represent the people whose families rejected them. And there are higher rates of homelessness, ending up in sex work, or attempting suicide. The orange bar show the people whose families were accepting. There are still high risks, but it's better when the family's accepting. So think about it. If you had no family, because your family rejected you, no ID and no job, how would you live? And how would you feel? Who would you be and who would be your family? In a large study of the street children in Ho Chi Minh City, they found that they were under a lot of stress because of family rejection, being forced to leave their homes, rejected by shelters and healthcare providers. So there was a lot of depression and loneliness leading to alcohol use, self-cutting, and alcohol and drug abuse and suicide attempts. We see a lot of psychological stress for the people who are transgender compared to the population at large is only 5% in the last month. We see the suicide attempt rate much higher, 40% for the transgender population because of all the stressors compared to the 4.5% for the average population. The point of all this is that being transgender is not the mental illness. The stress of being transgender creates the depression, the anxiety, all of these factors. This brings us to an idea called minority stress. That is the term we use for anybody who is not part of the majority group, and there are many ways of being a minority. There is stress that is unique to being transgender. Cisgender people don't ever have to come out. They don't ever have to explain it. They don't have to get hormone treatments, or go through name changes the same way that transgender people do. I'll tell you a brief story. I told you I like to dance. 
I had a friend, a female friend I took dance lessons with. And it was the year after I finished my presidency of the Georgia Psychological Association and the year after my parents had passed away. It had been a very difficult year. So dancing was my only fun. It was very important to me. And I went to go dancing and met this friend and I, we danced together enough I felt like I needed to tell her that I was transgender. I did not want to keep a secret from her. But she lived in a more conservative area than I lived in. I live in a very liberal area, many LGBT people. And I didn't know for sure how she would react. But I told her, and she had a very warm and kind response. Driving home, I felt my body go, again and again and again. And I realized that was me carrying minority stress. All the adrenaline, all the tension, the fear in my body. That's not good for my body. It's not good for any transgender person's body. And it's based in the fact that sometimes there is negative reactions. There are people who are discriminatory. There are people who say mean things or who do violent things with trans people. And it is hard enough and we feel strange enough being transgender until we come to accept and understand that we're just born this way and we need the medical treatment or whatever kind of treatment we need to acknowledge our gender. This stress causes health-related concerns psychological and physical medical concerns. And we need to think about that there are risks involved as well as protective factors here. The risks come from microaggressions. These are insults that are devaluing people, that are little slights, ways of putting people down. They may be jokes, they may be hidden, or they may be direct. I have experienced both. Even when people did not know I was transgender, they have said things in front of me. And so then I have to either say something because I do not want them to think that it's okay to say that, that it hurts people to say negative things about transgender people. But many transgender people will not speak up. They are not named microaggressions because they are small. Macroaggressions are the laws and the policies that oppress and forbid people from being able to be supported. Microaggressions are the things that individuals say, the small insults or the big insults or the minimizing and the invalidating comments. So risk and protective factors that you as healthcare providers can bring against the distal, the outside processes of prejudice and discrimination. As healthcare providers, you can help people dealing with the rejection and their hiding and the stigma by giving them support, by teaching coping skills, by connecting them with other people who are transgender or having things in your office that support transgender people. Another important part of the competencies is the interdisciplinary practice. Interdisciplinary practice means we work with many different types of health professionals. I'm a psychologist, but I'm here with endocrinologists, with surgeons, with primary care physicians. We have to have knowledge in our content area, but also in the other areas to work together. This is just another example about minority stress. 
Many transgender people avoid the restroom. Almost 60% avoid public restrooms because they do not want to get beaten up or assaulted or insulted. To do that, about a third of them limit their food and water and drinks. I don't know about you, but I don't do very well when I'm hungry or thirsty. But people are trying to function without adequate food or water to avoid the restroom, even children. As a result, about 8% of them end up with some type of medical problem, urinary tract infection, kidney infection. A mother told me of her child having impacted bowels and having to go to the emergency room so that it, this child did not die from their bowels exploding. So the professions practice together. The mental health, surgical, medical, legal is very important, as well as our systems and advocacy work, which we all will need to be doing. We also have content knowledge for our specific area that is part of the competency framework for the GEI. In mental health, you can look in the standards of care and see the requirements for what is wanted for mental health professionals, a master's degree, competence with DSM or ICD, and more. We also want continuing education and knowledgeableness about gender and gender diversity. For all healthcare professionals, we also want the same types of knowledge. And that may be across many disciplines. So that's why we have so many different disciplines who signed up and we want to train more disciplines. Nursing, psychology, mental health, medicine, voice and speech coaches. And those who work with youth need to have additional information about working with children, about child development, and the needs of children. All of us who work in this field need to have resources and people we can refer to. And we want to be able to assess somebody's needs and who we need to refer them to especially to give them hormone therapy, which is a very common thing that transgender people need. We need to attend regular meetings and trainings, like hopefully WPATH will be having our training in Hong Kong later this year. We hope you can come. And also knowing things about puberty blocking for the youth. We understand that's a new area here. Finally, the area of professional responsibility. We need to understand important things like confidentiality. Like we do not talk about other people who are our patients to other patients or professionals. We need to understand that they need an environment that is welcoming, whether we have signs that are welcoming or teach our staff to be respectful and use the right pronouns, use the ethical standards of WPATH and try to stay aware of our own gaps of knowledge and to grow in our knowledge in this field. And identify appropriate communication styles for trans people, like using the pronouns and the names that people prefer, and having the awareness of your trans culture here in Vietnam. We want, again, the pronouns and your staff to know what to do. And you need to figure out, I cannot say what you need to do here, but to have strategies for documenting in charts so that people can legally get gender markers changed or get the access to the care they need. And be aware of the family dynamics, especially with youth. So this is a transgender pride flag for some people. There are many, there are a few different versions. You might have that in your office. For physicians and medical providers, you want to have a sensitivity around your physical exams. Some of the, the doctors who will talk more about that. You can have forms and signage. In the forms in my office, I don't even have male or female. 
so people can identify however they want to me. The signs that your staff, and you want to make sure there's safety, and bathrooms that they can use safely, like neutral bathrooms or inclusive bathrooms. Finally, we want to, again, remember that there, it was an older idea that everybody used to change binary male to female or female to male. That's not the case. Not everybody wants medication. Not everybody wants to transition in a binary way. Not everybody feels trapped in the wrong body. My body was not the wrong body, just some parts were wrong. But my body has been great. I have hugged people I love. I have ridden motorcycles. I have jumped out of an airplane. This body has had many laughs and much love. I just needed a few parts fixed. But not everybody wants to do that. And we want to know that we want to support people however they need to express their gender. And I hope that all of you can do that as you work with this population. It's our responsibility, we have that power to advocate and to treat our patients well. Come on. Thanks again, Dr. Massey. That was such a wonderful talk. And many of the things that Dr. Massey talked about, their foundations for everything we'll be doing over the next four days. And I also want to thank the translators. Where are the translators? The translators that are doing the simultaneous translation. But what about the translators here? Are they, is that, is that you? It's just amazing. It must have been working every day. <laughs> Thank you. So next, we are moving into foundations in mental health. And in our, we met with some of you last night, and we learned that you don't have much mental health in Vietnam. How many people here are mental health practitioners? Go, oh, great, great. Oh, good, good. In uh, trans health, mental health is a very, very important component. One of the things that uh, Dr. Massey was talking about is that transgender, transsexual, gender identities, we have many names. Uh, the transgender umbrella is not a pathology, but the minority stress, the stigma, the many, uh, many aspects of being trans create conditions for many mental health conditions. But no one's identity is a disorder. That's a very important concept to understand. So I would like to introduce Dr. Randy Etner, who is going to give the talk, um, Foundations of Mental Health, uh, for the next, I think, 50 minutes or so. And Dr. Etner is a long-term colleague and friend of mine. Dr. Etner has been in the field for many years and is one of the most renowned, actually, clinical and forensic psychologist. Dr. Edner works in prisons in the United States. As you can imagine, trans people in institutions are not treated well. And uh, there are many cases that go to courts that require an expert witness. And almost any case you ever hear about in the United States, and probably elsewhere, the expert witness is Dr. Etner, along with having a, a long-term private practice. And Dr. Etner is also the secretary of our organization and has been on the board for many years. And 
She has just done so much. Oh, she's an author of the Standards of Care, one of the authors of the Standards of Care 8 and 7. And so she has changed the lives of more people than we can count. So, Dr. Etner. Thank you, Lynn. I want to say what a great pleasure and privilege it is for me to be here today. And I want to thank Dr. Wren Massey for sharing his story because it illustrates so many of the issues that mental health providers deal with. And we will go over those now as they are the very foundations of the mental health work that we do every day with our transgender clients. Early on, the standards of care required that individuals who wanted interventions, wanted gender transition, had to go through mandatory psychotherapy. And as you heard from Dr. Massey, there was an assumption that people would go from male to female or female to male. Our language reflected this at the time. We talked about male to female, transsexuals, and fortunately, our understanding of gender has expanded. More recently, with our knowledge of the different identities, and everybody's identity is as unique as their fingerprint, our goal of treatment is now lasting comfort in one's gendered body and not as it previously was, avoiding regret. Although psychotherapy is no longer a requirement, it may be more important than ever as we begin to understand the uniqueness of everybody's identity and to help them to find a way to live safely and comfortably in their firm gender. So this paradigm shift requires an individualized approach like all of medicine and not a one size fits all. As Dr. Massey indicated, many forces in society lead people to feel shame about their gender identity and to keep it hidden often for years or decades. And that leads not only to isolation, but to depression and oftentimes to other behaviors that are self-injurious. Shame is the most toxic emotion of all, and typically it leads to attack self or attack others. The impact on health of these negative social influences are what mental health professionals refer to as behavioral psychology. And they often exist in all societies with the effect of not permitting people the same access to health care as other populations have. So transgender people very often will avoid, for instance, routine screening. They may delay treatment even in the presence of symptoms that indicate disease. One study that was done showed that 
individuals who were transgender and had speech and hearing impairments didn't reveal their status as transgender because they were afraid that it would lead to inferior care. In fact, 40% of transgender individuals are afraid of accessing health care. Too often, higher levels of obesity, less physical activity than even lesbian and gay people occur in the transgender population and poorer overall health due to this fear of accessing health care. Stigmatization, bullying, and victimization are a blueprint for further and future mental and physical health problems. Many people have been so traumatized during the course of their lifetimes that they actually will require trauma treatment and mental health providers who are not trained in trauma-informed care may have to refer to specialists. We know that if we as therapists introduce the particulars of the trauma too soon, people will leave therapy. So making a secure and safe environment is essential in working with our clients. One of the biggest issues that we will encounter is the issue of disclosure. And I think Dr. Massey did a wonderful job of describing the fear of what will happen when I tell people who I am and what I need to do. And the fear of disclosing one's authentic and affirmed gender the fear of rejection can be as damaging to health as actual rejection. Disclosing to a spouse, to family members, to children, to colleagues, to employers can lead to incredible inner turmoil and real real rejection, or as we've seen, victimization, or worse. The common issues that we will encounter as therapists, in addition to depression, in addition to the fear of disclosure, is number one concern family, and relationships. How will this affect the family that I'm part of and the people that I love? For adults, the number one issue that I had to um, address in our office was how will this impact my children? For in the United States, about 40 to 70 percent of people who were requesting medical or surgical interventions were parents. So many people are depressed, and many of the depressed people are so used to feeling depressed that they don't recognize that they have clinical depression and they think that this is just their personality. They think that they are just negative and depressed by nature. 
because they are so accustomed to feeling sad. And anxiety is also a component of depression. Of course, anxiety and depression affect bodily systems and all of the organs in the body. So they affect our sleep, our energy regulation, digestion, etc. We hope that our primary care providers and those that we work with will screen for depression, but we are always aware that depression is the number one issue that we will encounter when we're working with people who are gender non-conforming. Self-harm, often in adolescence, is something that mental health providers will see frequently. But we also see it in adults. And we see many forms of self-harm, including workaholics, people who will take on too many things as a way of avoiding dealing with a gender conflict. Smoking, substance abuse, eating disorders, high-risk sexual behavior, are all examples of self-harm. And in prisoners, we see a great deal of self-harm, including surgical self-treatment, the removal of one's testicles, or an attempt to remove one's testicles or one's penis. And we only see that in the absence of adequate medical care. Oftentimes, mental health professionals and medical professionals are reluctant to ask clients about suicide and suicidal ideation. We tend to not want to talk about that. And yet we know that suicide attempts are inordinately high in our transgender and gender non-conforming population. We also know that people who complete suicides typically have been to a medical or mental health provider a month prior to their death. So this really underscores the need to ask and to explore with our clients and to listen without shying away and to accompany someone as they talk about the depths of despair that they feel because there is great comfort in knowing that someone is willing to go to that very dark place with you and not back away from it. Transition is a time when many people first approach a mental health provider and even very well-adjusted people can go through a destabilization period when they begin to transition, or at some point in transition, when suddenly everything changes. Hormones change, life changes, work can change, and people can experience a shift in their sexual orientation during transition. 
many people become impatient when colleagues or family members don't call them by their preferred name or don't immediately accept their transition. And it requires some patience to understand that our loved ones are transitioning with us by proxy. And it may have taken us many years to get to this point. We have to give them time as well. Sexuality is also an issue that brings people to the mental health clinician. People who are in long-term partnerships will often find that their partner is very destabilized by the gender transition. Oftentimes we will hear a wife say, if my husband becomes a woman, does that make me a lesbian? And very often this is a question and an issue that we as mental health providers must be prepared to deal with. Sexuality is very much tied up with gender transition. And very often people leave the hospital with new genitals, but no instruction manual. And they don't know how to care for these new genitals. And oftentimes people will ask for very direct advice such as, do I need to douche, and how often, et cetera, et cetera. Understanding one's sexual self and accommodating to new body parts can be an important part of consolidating identity. Making an authentic presentation in, an, in one's affirmed gender is important to some people more than others. Some people become very anxious about presenting an authentic appearance in their affirmed gender. And many people become very fearful that they will be identified as living or appearing in a gender other than the one they were assigned at birth. So I want to just share a brief story about a client who was assigned male at birth and made a very successful transition and was living the life that she dreamed of as a woman. However, previously, when she was living as a man, she was a radio announcer. And she had a very deep voice. And as you know, that's not something that can be changed with hormones. So even though she felt comfortable in her presentation, this woman was afraid to speak because she felt if she opened her mouth, immediately she would be revealing her status. She would be coming out and that created a tremendous amount of fear. So she began to avoid going to the grocery store because she was afraid that the person who took her money would say, 
hello, how are you? And she would have to answer. So she stopped purchasing food. She would take her garbage out at night when she felt her neighbors were asleep so she didn't have to speak to a neighbor. And finally and tragically, she stopped leaving her house altogether because she felt that her voice would put her in scrutiny and in harm's way. So this is just to indicate that for some people, being able to make a completely authentic transition is very important and for other people, much less so. I believe the most important human need is the need to be understood. And that is really the goal of gender affirming therapy. Many, many people, and we've seen today the tragedy of people who are isolated, kicked out, who are living on the street, and who lack any form of community. And yet we know that spirituality and a spiritual life is so important in health it is the one modifiable factor. If we, as providers, can help people find or be connected to a spiritual community, we will improve their health. And that is an evidence-based truism. Spiritual life correlates not only with better physical health, but with a reduction in all mental health issues and lower disability rates. Sometimes, as mental health professionals, we will see people who have complex psychiatric issues. And that's not surprising, given that in the United States, 50% of people at one time or another in their life will be diagnosed with a mental health illness. Part of what mental health professionals do is assess for these co-occurring conditions, and often we refer to psychiatrists if these conditions require separate or pharmacological treatment. But the presence of psychiatric disorders does not obviate surgical or medical treatment if a person is stable enough to undergo surgery, then having a comorbid condition, even schizophrenia, does not rule out a person's ability to get essential treatment for gender dysphoria. One of our colleagues in the United States, Dr. George Brown, has treated an individual who has dissociative identity disorder, what we used to call multiple personality disorder. And that patient had 23 alternate personalities. The person was able to successfully undergo 
gender-affirming surgery and had vaginoplasty 10 years ago. It was very successful and Dr. Brown still treats this person, but the gender dysphoria has been completely attenuated and they now work on other issues. So occasionally we will see people who present with complex psychiatric issues. One area that the mental health professional can really play an important role in is improving the communication between patients and medical and surgical providers. We know that very often transgender people don't access medical care. Transgender women may not report some symptoms such as smoking or diabetes or other chronic illnesses because they're afraid they won't be allowed to implement estrogen treatment. And we have to always be willing to communicate culturally relevant information to providers that informs care. And this is part of our interdisciplinary practice. We had uh, one patient that our primary care provider had seen and the surgeon had seen. This was a young East Indian woman who was in perfect health, perfect candidate for genital surgery and she came for a second opinion. She was written a referral. She proceeded to surgery, but no one knew that this patient thought she could substitute meditation for medication. And after surgery, she refused all of the medication, pain medication, and anti-embolism medication, and was in danger of uh, having a, uh, a very serious event. And the hospital really went crazy. They didn't know what to do with this patient. And the more that they insisted that she take medication, the more agitated she got, and she wanted to jump out of bed, and she wanted to leave the hospital. And all of this could have been avoided if we had been more careful about understanding this intersectionality of culture and how that informed the care that this individual was about to receive. We also want to encourage clients to be honest with their providers, to give a complete report of their history. One thing that we learned, and I think Dr. Wren illustrated this so beautifully, is that keeping a secret takes a toll. Now he gave a big sigh to indicate how much relief there was in letting go of the secret. But keeping a secret for years has health repercussions. In Chicago, we did a large scale study and discovered that individuals who kept their gender identity secret were twice as likely to develop hypertension due to the cardiac reactivity of stress. Stress is a killer and keeping secrets is stressful. We know also that transgender patients often 
are reluctant to share information about themselves because they are accustomed to keeping certain things secret or private. Maybe you remember when you were 10, 11, or 12 and he had a best friend. You told your best friend everything. Well, if you were transgender, you couldn't tell someone everything when you were 10 or 11 or 12. So studies have shown that transgender patients are less likely to verbalize their problems when they do see a medical provider. So we can encourage our medical colleagues to often override the impulse that the transgender person may have to keep things secret by actively listening, asking questions, allowing ample time for patients, and initiating a dialogue, sending a signal that we really want to know who you are and what your health status is. I'm told that in Africa, in parts of Africa, when people greet each other, they say, how's the body? Because the body is so important to how we feel and who we are. So I will now ask Lynn to accompany me and uh, start a dialogue if there are some questions from our mental health colleagues or to look at some of the questions that the mental health professional will likely encounter in this work. Uh, xin tự giới thiệu, uh em uh, tên là Hà. Thì hiện tại em đang làm uh, điều phối một cái uh, tổ chức cộng đồng của người chuyển giới tại Hà Nội. Thì trong quá trình làm việc thì em xin phép đặt câu hỏi bởi vì em không mặc dù em không phải là bác sĩ nhưng mà cái câu hỏi này thì em nhận được rất nhiều từ những cái người làm chuyên môn và những người uh, đang là tham vấn tâm lý và đang cung cấp dịch vụ cho các bạn là người chuyển giới. Thì cái câu hỏi thường xuyên nhất mà em nhận được từ các bác sĩ hoặc là các chuyên gia tham vấn đó là cái tỷ lệ người chuyển giới mà hối hận À, sau khi đã lựa chọn các cái, uh, cái các cái hình thức can thiệp y học ví dụ như là sử dụng hormone hoặc phẫu thuật là bao nhiêu phần trăm và uh, tỷ lệ đó là bao nhiêu phần trăm tại Việt Nam và cái điều đó thì uh, gây trở ngại cho rất nhiều những cái người làm tham vấn tâm lý hoặc là những người là bác sĩ phẫu thuật có thể uh, cung cấp dịch vụ cho cho những bệnh nhân là người chuyển giới và uh, Hà và em muốn đặt câu hỏi cho uh, các chuyên gia đến từ WPAT là trong cái uh, Kinh, kinh nghiệm về chuyên môn của mình thì thì uh, trong uh, uh, bối cảnh ở, ở Mỹ và các nước khác và trên toàn thế giới thì uh, uh, xử lý cái số liệu này như thế nào và trong cái kinh nghiệm thực tế của mình thì đã có cái trường hợp nào cái ca bệnh học nào mà uh, mọi người thấy là đã hối hận sau khi chuyển giới và cái nguyên nhân sao, uh, ẩn ở bên dưới nó là cái gì có phải là do thiếu cái uh, uh, dịch vụ y tế hay là do shame tức là do người người đó đã sống và đối mặt với nhiều kỳ thị phân biệt đối xử nên người đó cảm thấy là uh, cái kỳ vọng sau phẫu thuật không được như mong muốn hay là bất cứ một cái nguyên nhân nào thì muốn hỏi kinh nghiệm của các bác sĩ ở đây. Thank you for that question. Uh, I'm going to repeat it to see if I have it accurately. The question is about regret following medical and surgical interventions. Have I seen regret? And what are the reasons for regret? The literature, very recent literature, in a study that was just submitted for publication, maybe today it got published, was a survey of all of the surgeons who work in this field. And worldwide, surgical, after surgical treatment, regrets are less than 1%. The major reason for regret is usually poor surgical outcome. 
So what we say is that if someone has surgery and they're urinating and their stream is going up to the ceiling rather than into the toilet, they may feel regret. So poor surgical treatment is most frequently given as the um, reason for regret. In terms of hormones, we know that hormones have a tendency to actually improve psychological functioning and psychological testing has demonstrated that people even after six months on hormones will show improved psychological well-being. And many people have gone off of their psych psychotropic medication after starting or after being on hormones because they have a level of well-being that they haven't previously received, they haven't previously attained. In the prisons where I often work, when transgender people are depressed or anxious, rather than treating the gender dysphoria, they're given antidepressants or anti-anxiety drugs, and that does not help. And those people will continue to deteriorate because their depression is caused by the gender dysphoria and the source, that is what must be treated appropriately. So very often people think that um, surgery will lead to regret, but the true statistics about regret are rare. I have seen um, two clients who came to me years after they had surgery and they said that they regretted it. I wasn't the person who treated them at the time, but one of them felt, one of them actually went to a foreign country for surgery, decided they didn't want surgery and tried to leave because of the language barrier. The nurse thought that they were just anxious, gave them a lot of sedation, and they went through surgery. So that was an unfortunate case. Does that answer the question? I'd like to comment as well, if that's all right. I think that was a really good response and is absolutely consistent with my experience. Of, I want to talk more anecdotally. Dr. Etner is speaking from the research with evidence base, which is so helpful. And I would like to see that article that you said is coming out. I think that would be so useful. But I want to talk a bit about how, as a person who has worked for so many years, when I first started, seeing my first clients 40 years ago, I had the, a very much of a concern that people would regret because it just seemed like what we were doing was experimental. And I'm talking many years ago and without all of this research. But what I learned, and I, I mean, I tried to help people uh, not transition because that was the way we thought back then. It never worked. Everything I tried, because people knew who they were. People know if they're a man or a woman or non-binary. You just know it. And so after, after all these years in my practice, I've never seen anyone detransition, never. I have had people who have said, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't have to transition because I could live a more non-binary way, but I have no regrets. No, no regrets for doing it, 
but I, w I wouldn't have had to. But that's different than having, than having a regret. So I think that people who are concerned about it, they probably haven't had much exposure or knowledge about trans people, haven't talked to many. That's what it takes. It takes to getting to know people, hearing their stories. When you listen, if you're not trans, I am not, in listening to people's stories, listening to the depth of who they are, there's, you don't have to worry about it. But there is a concern, okay, so what if somebody does regret it? Um, one of the things that is very important as a provider is when you're talking to people is explore the possibility. In other words, all right, you're making a major decision about your life and that's what you're doing. It's your body and you're making this decision. What would happen to you if you've had a bad outcome? <coughs> What would happen to you if, say, 20 years from now, you decided that this wasn't what you wanted to do? Are you the type of person who can take responsibility for your own life? And most people can. But I think that's something that's important. So one of the things we all do as providers is we explore with our clients and our patients the, uh, what, what they imagine. They're capable of imagining themselves 10, 20, 30, 40 years ahead. And, I, and, and then take responsibility for the decision. So that's a different way of talking about it. Is that also helpful to when you think about it? Okay. Is there, where's another question? Lynn, I think Ren has a Ren, comment. Yeah, yeah, oh, comment, yes. Yeah, you can certainly comment about it. I'll just add two things. I have seen about a thousand transgender people I've worked with, and the one percent rate is consistent with my experience of regrets, and most of those people, the regret is because of the rejection by family by their job or socially. It's not that they are not transgender, but they're encountering problems with people not being accepting. And I would just add on a personal note, my only regret is that I didn't figure it out sooner and get to enjoy more years of being a man. And I think we'll discuss the issue of aging in our advanced mental health. Yes. A plug uh, for section on health. Thursday. Other Any other questions? Tôi xin có một câu hỏi vì tôi làm ở phòng khám sức khỏe vị thành niên thì chúng tôi cũng thường xuyên là làm việc và gặp những cái cháu bé ở lứa tuổi từ rất là nhỏ khi là sáu bảy tuổi cho đến tuổi 18, 19 tuổi đều đến khám vì lý do bố mẹ đưa đến khám vì vấn đề về mặt giới tính và đặc biệt ở cái tuổi vị thành niên thì là thường là do trẻ cái cái vấn đề nó trẻ đòi chuyển giới thế thì không biết là ở đây thấy các bác ở đây đang đề cập đến vấn đề về mặt chuyển giới nhưng mà với các anh các chị có cái um, kinh nghiệm gì làm việc với ví dụ những cái trẻ rất là nhỏ tầm năm sáu tuổi và bạn ấy đã có cái giới tính ví dụ bạn trai là bạn luôn luôn là bạn chơi các trò chơi của con gái và mặc quần áo tất tật trang phục của con, của con gái đấy là tầm năm sáu tuổi đã có đã định có có như thế rồi và đặc biệt ở cái trẻ tuổi vị thành niên khi 17, 18 tuổi là bạn quyết 16, 17 tuổi bạn nặng nặc bạn đòi gia đình bắt buộc phải chuyển giới thì bạn mới tiếp tục đi học bạn tiếp tục công việc khác nữa thì rất là mong là các chuyên gia cho cái ý kiến Excellent. Randy or Ren? Who wants to respond? So um, we did see, we do see adolescents and children in Chicago. Now there is a hospital in Chicago that deals entirely with children, a section of a hospital that deals entirely with children and adolescents, and they will be giving a talk tomorrow. So rather than give you uh, my experience. I think they have a tremendous amount of uh, information. That is tomorrow, isn't it? That. So Steve, yeah, maybe you'll answer that. 
Um, <clears throat> hi, my name is Steve Rosenthal. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist uh, in San Francisco at the University of California. And my colleague, Diane Ehrenseft, who is our mental health director, she's a child psychologist. She will be speaking tomorrow, and she will be specifically talking about the very young children who are pre-pubertal, not yet in puberty, but who feel that they are another gender than was assigned at birth. Um, as a medical provider in a little while after lunch, I will tell you about our experience providing medical treatments for adolescents. Um, and uh, this is work that was pioneered by the Netherlands. So it was very wonderful that this morning we had the ambassador from the Netherlands who have been so supportive of this program uh, because they really have done the pioneering work starting over 30 years ago to begin to offer possibilities for adolescents. Thank you. I'll just add that also tomorrow, Dr. Scott Leibowitz will be talking about adolescents who have approached or are in puberty or post-pubertal. It is a complicated area. And those of us who work with adolescents are very careful to take into consideration the many developmental issues and fertility issues in discussing these matters with the children or the adolescents and their parents. Vâng ạ, xin chào toàn thể hội nghị. Em, em xin có một vài các cái câu hỏi ngắn thôi ạ. À, em là bác sĩ chuyên ngành tâm thần. Thì em có muốn hỏi là ở trong những các cái đối tượng của người chuyển giới thì cũng có rất là nhiều những các cái vấn đề liên quan đến sức khỏe tâm thần. Ví dụ như là trầm cảm hay là sử dụng chất. Thì trong những các cái vấn đề liên quan đến sức khỏe đấy thì những các cái tình trạng trầm cảm và những các cái tình trạng loạn thần thì có thể ảnh hưởng đến những các cái quyết định hoặc những các cái um, uh, những các cái suy nghĩ của bệnh nhân. Thì uh, muốn hỏi là có nhất thiết là phải điều trị ổn định những các cái tình hình đấy không? Và cái câu hỏi thứ hai là khi mà uh, điều trị cho những các cái trường hợp chuyển giới thì có có cần nhất thiết là phải điều trị cho những các cái trường hợp liên quan đến gia đình hay không? Tại vì khi mà nhận được một cái uh, uh, stress như vậy thì họ cũng sẽ rất là có rất là nhiều những các cái vấn đề về sức khỏe. Vâng, xin hết ạ. Yes, we work with families because we understand that we all are part of a family and very often our family relationships will influence us to a larger or lesser degree. So we work with couples, with children, with spouses, whatever an individual requires. The mental health professional plays many roles, and one of them is being a family therapist, a couples therapist, understanding each individual and their unique situation. In terms of stabilizing, before surgery, people who have psychiatric issues that require them to be on medication or under the care of a psychiatrist, we will ascertain that they are stable enough to undergo surgery. And so we will try to make sure as it says in the standards of care, that that condition, whatever it is, is well controlled prior to surgery. But conditions such as depression or anxiety may actually improve with mental health treatment. And so we don't always treat the depression as something that needs to be medicated, we often determine whether it is something that requires medication or whether it is just part of our work to help the person come to terms with the stress. As, as, as Dr. Wren said, once he understood what he needed to do, he no longer felt depressed. And so, it's our job to assess whether the depression is requires treatment or if there are other medications that need to be 
administered for such as bipolar conditions or other mental health conditions. Lynn, you want to add to that? I, Is I it on? Yeah, on. I think it's on now. But I would want to say that oftentimes issues such as depression and anxiety are created by the dysphoria so that if someone would be saying, well, you're too depressed, you can't have a medical intervention, an alternative response would be the treatment of the medical intervention is what the depression and anxiety may need. And it's something that has to be very consciously discussed with the person, and, an inter, and we are an interdisciplinary field, so surgeons, mental health providers, primary care people might all ha discuss what, and with the person themselves, what is in the best interest moving forward. So I, did that answer, well, who asked the question? It was back here? Yeah. Does, does that answer the question? Or did you have something else? Because you were, when you were talking about families. Uh, rất là cảm ơn uh, uh, những các cái câu trả lời của các báo cáo viên nhưng mà thực sự ra thì uh, uh, những các cái vấn đề về trầm cảm và lo thì nó không phải chỉ có mỗi về những các cái vấn đề về uh, uh, những các cái kỳ thị của bệnh nhân hoặc là những các cái vấn đề mà bệnh nhân uh, mong muốn trải nghiệm mà thực sự ra đối với những các cái trường hợp bệnh nhân thì uh, thực, uh, trong cái quá trình thực hành lâm sàng thì uh, tôi cũng đã có rất là nhiều những các cái bệnh nhân mà cũng có những các cái tình trạng lạm dụng chất kèm theo thì họ có, cũng có những các cái tình trạng loạn thần cũng rất là rõ rệt và những các cái tình trạng loạn thần đấy thì uh, chắc chắn là nó sẽ ảnh hưởng đến những các cái dòng tư duy và những các cái dòng suy nghĩ của bệnh nhân vậy thì uh, cái câu hỏi đặt ra là những các cái vấn đề trầm cảm và những các cái vấn đề loạn thần thì có bắt buộc là phải điều trị trước khi mà mình uh, để cho bệnh nhân đưa ra một cái quyết định nào đấy hay không? I think in those cases, yes, if the person's depression is affecting their ability to make decisions and if it, they have other issues then yes we want to make sure that the depression is treated appropriately as any other co-occurring condition would be and of course we don't want to do any um, irreversible interventions on someone when we think that they're uh, they can't provide an informed consent, or that their judgment may be impaired, or they have poor reality testing, or their drug abuse may impact their ability to uh, take post-operative care in a uh, very uh, serious and uh, straightforward way, because after surgery, there is a great deal of post-operative care And so we want to make sure that people understand all of that prior to undergoing any interventions. So yes, those conditions would be a concern for the mental health provider. I think that was the last question we had time for in terms of the mental health portion. Keep in mind, we have a full day, day three, on mental health as well as another day on child and adolescence. So we'll have lots of opportunities to talk about mental health issues. And as you can see, it's a very important aspect of interdisciplinary care. So the questions are excellent. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Thank everyone. you, Dr. Randy. And uh, thank you for coming back after lunch. Uh, I am so very pleased to be here. It is my uh, second time uh, in Vietnam, and I'm very much uh, like Hanoi <laughs> so far. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, foundations in primary care. And uh, I understand that this is, yeah, hopefully, can you hear me? OK, good. I'll be talking a little bit about foundations in primary care. So I'm just to kind of set uh, things. Do we have my slides up? Can we have the next slide? Oh, yes, but these up here? Yeah. Um, I'm from uh, New York City, uh, which is on the east side of the United States. And I work at 
an LGBT uh, community health center. So, and we see uh, close to 5,000 uh, trans and gender diverse uh, patients. So, you know, what I wanted to uh, talk about really was um, how we manage, uh, how we manage uh, provision of trans health care in uh, like a non-specialist center. And a lot of what I'll be talking about is, um, again, with care provided by primary care providers. And, you know, it's really interesting the more I've got to know about the health system here in Vietnam, I see a lot of parallels. You know, in the United States, we also have a public uh, health system as well as a private health system. Um, we also have levels of care. So I would think that the comparison of primary care, um, community health care would be like the commune health, health center and uh, district health center. Okay. So what we try and do in the United States is, um, as we're providing health care, especially in rural areas, is try and uh, do trans health care in the like community health clinics um, and not totally in specialist clinics. So I'll talk a little bit about the role of the primary health provider in uh, transgender care and a little bit about the, the types of care that um, the primary care providers should be able to uh, uh, give and also uh, a little bit about prevention, like HIV, um, different types of prevention, preventive health care, cancer screenings. And uh, I think that's really mostly what I'll be talking about today. So we already went through this with uh, Dr. Massey earlier today, which was um, really the fact that many of the patients that you'll be seeing, trans and gender diverse patients, are very, sometimes very afraid to come into health settings, right? They're afraid that they're going to be mistreated. We know um, from data from the United States that shows that about a third of transgender people avoid health care, um, even if they're really sick, you know, even if they're having a heart attack and have chest pain. I was, and this is everywhere in the world. I was in uh, doing a training in uh, Guyana, which is, uh, you know, Guyana is a country, it's in uh, South America. And I, what I heard from one of the, tra the transgender people I was talking to was that she was at a party, she fell down, she broke her arm, and, and even though she was in so much pain, she didn't want to go to the hospital um, because she was afraid of how people would treat her. So she walked around with a broken arm that set, uh, set improperly because of that. And, you know, um, when it, even when I think of all the people that I take care of, and we're in New York, in a, in a center that caters to LGBT people, there are many people who don't want to come in for health care because they're uh, so afraid. So uh, the other thing, of course, is uh, this is from the USTS uh, study. Many of these data, um, the study that you heard about from Dr. Massey, people who um, don't want to disclose their identity is often a, a big problem. Um, but again, we covered most of this uh, earlier this morning. But I wanted to move on to primary care. And again, I know that uh, there are many changes happening with the health system in Vietnam. And uh, the idea is to improve the primary health care at the, the, at the lowest level. And you know we go through the same thing in the United States. So this making primary care trans friendly. This was an article that was written, um, talking about the necessity for primary care providers to actually do this care. Right. Um, everything that it that we do as far as providing hormones, um, you know. Uh, taking care of people after they've had surgery, if they've had surgery, uh, talking to people about cancer screenings. This is everything that can be done on a primary care level. Uh, so the statement that was, um, the statement that was made in the article was, uh, and I think it's not written there in Vietnamese, but the medical knowledge needed to treat transgender people is not particularly complex but patients still often struggle to find doctors who are prepared to treat them. And the, um, the other area is that for primary care providers, what it's saying is that they should be competent in providing care to transgender people, and that includes hormone therapy, 
um, coordination of specialty care, um, pre and post surgical care, and screening for mental health issues. And this is like a foundations level, but you'll be hearing much more about this um, over the next few days. So when we think about uh, primary care and taking, you know, the, the last time I was here in Vietnam, I was in Hue and I spoke to a very large group of endocrinologists about hormone care. But it was, it was interesting that I was doing that because I really do believe that this care is not, uh, even though we have endocrinologists with us today, that it, it's, it's not really uh, care that can only be handled by endocrinologists, but primary care providers. So this is looking at content knowledge. Um, what do primary care providers need to know in order to provide respectful care um, and competent care, right? So um, people should know everything around initiating hormones and how to follow people up on hormones. Again, they need to be able to screen people for uh, mental health issues. They need to know all about the lives of transgender people. So all the other things that uh, people might do um, to affirm their gender, such as if you don't have access to uh, surgery, to like mastectomy to remove the breast for a, a transgender man that you know perhaps um, he might bind the chest and that can come with some medical issues. Uh, for trans feminine people uh, who haven't had uh, bottom surgery um, or genital surgery might wish to tuck the genitals away and that can also have uh, medical issues that come along with it. These are all things that providers need to be aware of. Um, they need to know how to do the physical exam. They need to understand how to ask questions in the correct way. And we'll be covering uh, more of this uh, actually tomorrow. And I'll talk a little bit about preventive care, but I know there'll be other people talking about that. Um, you know, how to navigate uh, systems. How do you refer someone from the commune health center to uh, maybe the provincial level health center or central level, right? How, do you, how are you going to do that? And I think these are all questions that you need to uh, ask because you are you have such a great opportunity we've we've learned from our mistakes but you have an opportunity to do it right the the first time um, and also if you're going to be referring people perhaps you if someone wants surgery and maybe you don't have the the right surgeons in Vietnam how, how are you going to help someone to get uh, surgery so as a primary care provider one of the things that uh, I often tell students that I train is, you know, the initial encounter is very, very important. And when you're seeing a, a transgender client for the first time, it's really important that, um, that you're not making any assumptions about their identity, about their sexual orientation, about um, their lifestyle, and so on. So stay open-minded um, and be uh, affirming and respectful. Um, we talked a lot this morning about safe spaces. So when I walked into um, this, uh, this space today, you know, I noticed that there were restrooms. And I noticed that the restrooms were sex uh, segregated. So you had restrooms for men and you had restrooms for women. And to think about what it means um, for someone who, especially who's non-binary identified, or someone who um, identifies as a trans man or a trans woman, but when you look at them, maybe you don't see a man or a woman, right? How it feels for them to come into a place like this and to not know if they can use a restroom. And you heard already today that it can be really difficult for, um, and um, medically problematic for people to have to not be able to go to a restroom when they need to, right? So think about in these new environments that you're building for trans people, how you're going to, um, how you're going to figure out who they are, right? And you can't only ask these questions of people who you think are trans, but you need to start asking them of everybody. So asking everybody about their gender identity, uh, as you'll see. So, uh, you know, the other things that we often say, uh, you know, to allow people the time and space to tell you about their, their story and their life. And I don't know how things are here, but where I work in uh, New York, we get a little, little bit of time. So I have 10 minutes to see a patient. So sometimes it can be very difficult um, to give people space, but then it's only 10 minutes. So um, trying to figure out uh, how you make that happen. So. Um, 
But when I have someone who's coming in and they're asking about hormones, uh, there are questions that we, we generally ask. You know, as a medical provider, I ask people about what they know about hormones, what they've heard, what they expect hormones to do. Um, around their own uh, transition, I ask them who they've disclosed to. Uh, and you've heard some uh, story today from Dr. Massey about how he was able to explain his story to his family and, and colleagues, but I ask this of my patients. Um, asking people if they've accessed hormones, um, what I learned the last time I was in Vietnam is that a lot of people ac do access hormones here, right? So it's already happening. So how can we do it within medical settings to, um, so people get the correct doses and they aren't doing this on their own? Um, and, uh, and again, not being judgmental about that because there's a reason why people access hormones on their own is because it's very difficult to access hormones right now through the medical system. So the other thing is around language, and I understand that obviously language is very different here, but there are some terms that you uh, can use and other terms that you can avoid. Um, but the first is true that there's no standard language that's going to be correct for all people, all patients. And when we talk about sexual health this week, you'll, you'll hear that. Um, you know, we're, we try in my clinic to use gender neutral language, especially with new patients, because we don't know what their gender identity is. We also try and avoid gendered language to refer to bodies. So, um, you know, I ask people about you know, uh, chest, um, using the chest, you know, are you having issues or, or um, if I talk about screening, I'll talk about cancer screening, but I'll refer to the chest, for example, in a transmasculine patients. We don't use words like uh, fix, complete, correct, normal, or real, right? So a way that that might come up is, say you had a, a transgender woman in front of you, you would not want to ask her if her transition is complete because that's not, there's not, no such thing as complete. You, your, you know, your identity is something internal. So it's, there's no beginning or end to that. We also don't want to say things like, um, well, you look like a real woman or a real man. Again, you heard today that can be really problematic. So we try and avoid those types of words because they do carry a message that you don't think that people who haven't had surgery or who haven't accessed hormones um, are real. Uh, and again, this may not be something that you, you see here, but it's certainly something that we struggle with in the United States. Um, the other part is around doing a comprehensive health assessment. So everyone who comes into the clinic, especially for the first time, uh, we do a very complete medical history, especially um, because, as you heard earlier today, many transgender people have avoided medical care. Sometimes when I see someone in the clinic as an adult, it may be the first time that they've seen a medical provider since they were um, you know, a, a child and maybe getting vaccinations. So it may be the first time as an adult that they've come in. Um, they may have uh, a medical complaints that they haven't addressed with anyone that's very separate from their trans identity. Um, you also heard today that people um, have stresses in their life and they may well be uh, uh, maybe drinking alcohol or may maybe smoking cigarettes or maybe using other drugs. So this is an opportunity to get that information and to provide uh, counseling and care. Asking about over-the-counter medications as well as whether people have access hormones on their own. Uh, you heard a lot already today about getting information on the trauma history and psychological history. Um, sexual health, again, I'll be talking about, but often, again, people may never have been tested for or screened for a sexually transmitted infection or HIV, so it's a good opportunity to do that. Um, again, getting information on family history is important, and also immunization history and preventive screens. And we know from data all over the world that transgender people often avoid cancer screenings and other preventive care screenings. So again, it's, this is all information you have to collect. Um, for the physical exam, because people have often avoided medical care and can be um, 
uncomfortable, especially taking off clothes and having someone examine them, there are a few principles that you can follow. And I think the first thing is to always um, ask permission. And I know I've worked in many countries where having the conversation with people uh, and getting permission is not something that's usual, right? Um, I've worked in the Caribbean where as a provider, you know, often when the person came in, you just did what you did as a, as a physician, um, and you never asked the patient's permission, um, never explained anything. But, you know, this isn't a good way to work with people. It's really important, especially with trans people, to have that conversation and say, you know, I, I need to do an exam on you. It's not because I'm curious about your body. I, I want to do the exam on you because it's the right thing to do and because I need to make sure that everything is okay. But even that very short conversation is important. Um, for some people, um, at least where I work, uh, they might feel more comfortable having a friend with them or uh, uh, someone else in the room, so we make that available. Uh, you know, often, again, uh, people might have a lot of discomfort about showing their genitals. So I've had patients tell me um, that in 30 years, like, no medical provider had ever looked at their body, right? So again, having a conversation about why it's important. Um, and I think we covered the rest. I explained the purpose of the exam. Uh, around language, you know, uh, it sometimes comes up that uh, patients might not want you to use kind of technically correct like um, language for anatomy and may want you to use more gender neutral terms and that's also a conversation you can have. Uh, I had a um, uh, once in the Caribbean and it was quite unusual because I didn't expect to, to see it there. Um, you know I had a woman who was talking to me about her problem, a transgender woman and she said I have a dis discharge from my vagina. So I thought oh, she's had surgeries, this is why she's saying this. So she's had bottom surgery to construct a vagina, so I said, well, tell me about your surgical history. And she said, no, I haven't had surgery, but she called her anus her vagina. So that was a language that she used that was important for me not to make a mistake about this. Obviously, I made some assumptions and I shouldn't have. One of the other things you'll be hearing more about over the next few days is something called the primary care informed consent approach. So you've heard already today about a uh, little bit about um, mental health assessments and that in uh, some places that mental health assessment is done by a behavioral health provider before people have access to hormones or, um, uh, or surgery, right? Uh, in the primary care informed consent approach is a different model of care that's used in some countries um, and also in parts of the United States where the behavioral health assessment is actually done by a primary care provider. That's really the only difference. I mean, everything that you do during the visit, it should be the same. Um, and it really is the fact that the primary care provider it does everything from like A to Z. So initiates the hormone therapy after doing the medical and psychological um, assessment. It still means that the person, the, the patient who's accessing hormones um, still gets to discuss things like the risks and benefits of treatment. Um, there still has to be documentation of this, um, this visit and there still needs to be, um, you know, uh, again, you need to have the time to have this discussion with people. Uh, patients um, also need to understand uh, what can happen with hormones and also have their expectations addressed. I mean, I've had people think that, for example, transgender men might think that when they go on hormones like testosterone, that they can't get pregnant, but that's not true. You can get pregnant when you're on testosterone. So these are the kinds of things that we address in, um, in this visit. Uh, the reason why it's here is a separate slide, I have to say, is because for many years this approach was a little controversial uh, in the United States. If you go back 50 years or so, um, always it was uh, behavioral health provider did the psychological assessment um, and the medical provider would do uh, the medical, very, very separate. And it's only in the last few decades really, well more than that, but you know, that uh, there's been the opportunity for one person to do it all. 
Uh, in the next talk, you'll hear a lot more about hormone therapy. Again, I'm just providing like a, a few things, but um, the one part that the medical provider can do is really uh, to have conversations with patients about medications, um, choices of uh, dose and uh, route. So again, a conversation with people about um, do you want tablets, do you want injections, what the differences are, um, the differences in cost, where cost comes into play, um, whether or not there are differences with like cardiac risk, as we'll talk about, other concerns. People who are older perhaps might do better with different types of uh, treatments and dosing. Uh, for, for transgender men who are using testosterone, you know, is it injectable? Is it a gel or transdermal? We now have other formulations as well, long-acting formulations. But the same thing comes into play. You have to, to talk about what is best for the, um, for the patient. Uh, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about uh, progesterones, pellets, implants, and so on, because I do think that that's probably going to be discussed in the next talk. Uh, I had a conversation before this talk to ask about electronic health records, and I understand that at the highest level in the hospitals that you do have electronic health records. So, you know, it's also important to start thinking now um, as you're rolling out this care, how are you going to identify patients in electronic health records? You know, with a paper record, it was very easy. You know, if someone changed their gender or their name, you just put a line through or white out and you write it in again, right? Um, the, unfortunately, with electronic health records, it's not always as easy. So, you know, uh, we've had to think very hard about how we collect these data, where it goes into the medical record. If someone changes their pronouns or um, gender marker, how does it look? If you change your name, how does that look? Um, so uh, we're still also in the United States still working through um, a lot of this. I think the important things are um, that uh, the staff um, need to understand the importance of using correct pronouns, as you heard before today, and correct names if people use different names, and also the importance of confidentiality. I've worked in many countries where there's absolutely no confidentiality in healthcare. So if someone comes in, um, within minutes, everyone in the hospital knows, their family knows, and so on. So. Um, it, it's really important, especially in trans care, um, to keep things, uh, keep things confidential and that you're not inadvertently outing someone as trans if they, they don't want to be outed. Uh, this is the two-step question for uh, gender ID that we use. So we ask everyone, um, everyone who comes in the clinic, not just transgender people, um, what is your gender identity? And so people can say, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm gender non-binary, something else, you can fill it in. And the second question, um, asking people their sex assigned at birth. And we also, uh, in many clinics, uh, ask people what their pronoun is. And again, trying to think about how, how you document this uh, in, in the records. So this, this last few slides I was going to talk about uh, some other areas that are important for primary care providers. So the first is preventive care. So for transmasculine people, so people who are assigned female at birth who identify on the masculine spectrum, you know, there are certain um, preventive care uh, screenings that they need because most still have a cervix, for example. Um, so, you know, it's really important to remember that and to do appropriate uh, screening. There are many trans people who transgender men who might not want a pap test, but um, there are other options as well, like screening for HPV uh, in countries that you can use a, a um, you can do that. Uh, the other thing is around uh, chest or breast screening. If someone hasn't had uh, top surgery and they're older and they're uh, now at risk for breast cancer, for example, if, you're, if you do screening for uh, cisgender women who have breasts, then you should be able to offer the same screening for transmasculine folk who have breasts as well. So just thinking about how you're going to document that in your, in your charts and to follow people. Um, for transfeminine folk, if you look at the Endocrine Society guidelines, they're, um, 
is a recommendation that people are screened for um, breast cancer if they've been on hormones. Um, there actually isn't a time limit, but some people say it should be five years or more. And also thinking about other issues like bone health. Uh, you know, bone health is more important in some countries than others. So if you have screening tools for um, for uh, screening people for osteoporosis, need to think about how you're going to implement that also in trans communities. We know that transgender women, for example, have a low bone density, in, at least in one study, um, even if they're not on hormones. So thinking about how you're going to uh, screen people for that, um, how, how you're going to advise people. For example, if you see a transgender woman and she's had an orchiectomy, so you've removed the testes and maybe she doesn't have access to hormones, how are you going to give advice because she's at higher risk of osteoporosis? So we do, um, you know, these will all change from country to country because not all countries screen for things like osteoporosis. Not all countries have the availability of being able to do even mammography, right? So all of these guidelines have to change depending on the country that you're in. Um, for cardiovascular health, uh, you know, the one thing when I was in Hue last year, um, there were some excellent talks on cardiovascular health from the endocrinologists. Um, but the one thing that you should be aware of is that there aren't any specific cardiovascular disease risk calculators for transgender people. You know, when you're doing the risk calculator and you put in male or female, there isn't a transgender woman or transgender man, that, you know, kind of code, right, button to press for people who've had access to hormones. So um, often we have to make a best guess. So generally if I have someone, for example, um, a, you know, a transgender woman who's been on hormones from a very, very young age, um, and, you know, I might decide to run the calculator both male and female, and I figure the risk is somewhere in between. It doesn't usually make a big difference except when I'm trying to decide whether I should use a statin or not, right? But, um, you know, you have to think about how you're going to approach this, and I think it's a really good area for uh, research in Vietnam. Uh, for prostate cancer screening for transgender women, um, still have a prostate, you know, whether they've had uh, surgery or not. You'll be hearing about the different types of surgeries uh, tomorrow. Uh, so you have to think about things like prostate cancer. Even though it's not common, um, people may still need to be screened. Um, PSA levels, uh, we do PSA sometimes, and it's not routine in the United States anymore. But for someone who's on androgen blockers, again, you'll hear about this later in the next talk, um, the PSA levels can be artificially low. So it's something uh, to think about. For I know that people really aren't having bottom surgeries like vaginoplasty here at the moment, but people do go overseas to Thailand. So you may be seeing someone who's had bottom surgery. And if you do, um, just remember that the prostate can be examined uh, uh, on the anterior vaginal wall. There are a few considerations in aging that uh, you should be aware of. Um, the first is that we don't have any separate guidelines for people who are older. So when I see someone who comes into my clinic who's 20 years old, um, and I see someone who's 60 years old, and I see someone who's 80 years old, um, I don't have a lot of research to guide what I do. So we usually use common sense. Um, I generally say to my older clients, um, yes, I will use, I, we can start hormones, but the changes may be a little bit slower. Uh, and, you know, I tr try and treat everyone as an individual. And, you know, we, uh, for example, if someone has hyperlipidemia, I will treat it. If they have hypertension, I will treat it. If they're of an age where I should be doing cancer screenings, I do it. But, you know, unfortunately, we don't have really robust data in people who are older. Uh, and the other things that primary care providers uh, need to be aware of, we talked about initiation of care, but also ongoing care. So understanding that labs need to be done after someone initiates on hormones. Um, we also need to think about the other types of care someone might need. So, uh, you know, you're soon hopefully going to be writing prescriptions for people, understanding that it's not a one-time thing and that the prescriptions have to be uh, written again and again and again, lifelong. I always find it surprising when, you know, uh, 
Well, you know, I, I get medication from my provider and every month it's like a surprise that they have to write a prescription for me. It's like, no, like we talked about this before, you need to do this every month. So, um, you know, other things that primary care providers can usually help with, are changing legal documents, um, and again, providing psychosocial support and referrals when needed. Uh, you know, you'll hear more about the surgery, surgical interventions uh, over the next uh, few days, but I just put the list here so that you can see there are a lot of different um, interventions that people might um, request. So transgender women might, um, you know, they might go overseas and get, for example, facial surgeries, or they might get, um, you know, breast augmentation or have the Adam's apple removed or have other types of care. They might have the orchiectomy that we talked about or a vaginoplasty. And for transgender men, may also have a lot of surgeries and you'll hear about those. Like, for example, um, they might have a, the hysterectomy or they might have a phalloplasty. But again, you know, as a primary care provider, it's important that you, you understand all the procedures, even if you're not obviously providing them at the community level and understanding the kinds of things that people might need when they come back, especially if they're coming back from overseas. So, you know, we always provide uh, care, for example, asking people who've had surgeries, how do you feel? Um, do you have any problems? Are there complications? And thinking about if there are complications, how are you going to handle it? Um, and uh, whether it's for trans feminine surgeries or trans masculine. So again, I just wanted to kind of provide a, a few um, a few areas for you to think about over the next few days as you uh, as you see people. Um, you know, and just takeaway points here that uh, you know trans people first of all. They may see you and never access hormones and never access surgery. It doesn't make them less less of a trans person, right? So, so that's the important thing. Some people may see you only because they want to get hormones. Uh, and I think the other part is that if you're a primary care provider, just understanding that all of the primary care interventions should be available to people. Probably, I would say, maybe 1 50th of the health care that a trans person is going to need is related to getting affirming hormones, right? If they want them. But the other 49 out of 50, you know, is going to be just general routine healthcare. Um, and in order that people don't fall behind, it's super important that you create these settings that uh, people are gonna feel welcomed. So I think this was just a summary slide. So language matters, uh, hormones you'll hear more about. Preventive care is important. Again, it's not all about hormones and surgery. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Asa. And what we're going to do is hold off questions for Dr. Asa until Dr. Steve, Stephen uh, finishes his talk, and then we'll ask questions on both. So, now I would like to introduce Dr. Stephen Rosenthal who is a professor of pediatrics and pediatric endocrinology of the University of California, San Francisco, who will give a talk on foundations in hormonal treatment for adults and adolescents. Dr. Rosenthal is medical director of the Child and Adolescent Gender Center in San Francisco at UCSF. He's past president of the Pediatric Endocrine Society and he's a current board member of the Endocrine Society. He's also co-author of the Endocrine Society Clinical Practice Guidelines and co-author of the upcoming WPATH Standards of Care version eight. And something that I find very interesting about him is that in his limited free time, he is has a passion for figure skating and is participating in many national and international competitions all over the world. So I don't know if you have figure skating here in Vietnam, <laughs> but you can watch him on YouTube. Thank you, Dr. Steven.
So I'm very happy to be here and very, very honored uh, to have this opportunity. It's very meaningful for me at my age to come to Vietnam given our shared histories. And so I'm very touched and grateful for the incredibly warm hospitality that I have experienced since I've been here. And so I thank you very, very much for your kindness. <laughs> thank you. Come on. So, um, oops. So these are the learning objectives, as you can see. Um, there's quite a bit that I would like to review. Uh, some hormone basics and regulation of reproductive function. I'm going to be using terms primary and secondary sex characteristics. And just to be sure uh, what I mean when we're, what we mean when we're using those terms, I want to spend a moment to define some of those terms. I'm going to talk about a concept of puberty blockers. I know that transgender care in general is only just being considered now in Vietnam, but transgender care for youth, of course, is a separate category uh, that also is uh, perhaps somewhat newer in the world of transgender care. But um, I understand also that this is not yet available, but my hope is that by showing you what we have learned and from our colleagues and what we find, uh, what we're learning, that we can share this information together so that we can all uh, work together. We're going to talk about different uh, gender-affirming hormone treatments, and we're going to talk about not only the benefits, but also the potential adverse effects of hormone interventions and how we uh, try to minimize those possibilities. So can, can you raise your hand, please, if you are a medical person? Thank you. And do we have any endocrinologists or pediatricians in the room? Pediatrics or endocrinology? Okay, we do have some. Good. So this is just one very quick slide just to review the concept of hormones and hormone receptors. You can see different body parts and different parts of the slide here, the pituitary gland in the head. You can see um, kidneys, bones, and other organs. The definition of a hormone is simply a chemical, as you know, that is made in one part of the body. It goes into the bloodstream and has effects in another part of the body. We've been talking about testosterone and estrogen. So those are classic hormones because they're made in either the ovaries or testicles, but they have their effects throughout the body. One thing we also know, and this is very important because this has to do with one of the main treatments I'm going to be talking about. We know that in order to have any kind of hormone action, we need two things. We need the hormone and we need a normal hormone receptor. It's like a key going into a lock. Okay, so we must remember that as we go forward. So let's talk specifically about the hormones that regulate sexual function, reproductive function. So these are the hormones that are initiated in the brain. Is there a pointer here on my... Um, no, see, I can use this mouse. Can you see? No, that's only showing up. Well, I don't have... Oh, okay. All right, well, I don't know if you can see the screen. Actually, I'll just... Okay, you see a cartoon of a head uh, that contains the hypothalamus and the pituitary, and then you see below it, in blue and yellow, these are the gonads, meaning the ovaries or the testicles. And we know that the ovaries and testicles are not simply independently making their hormones, but they make their hormones in a very regulated fashion, right? So the hypothalamus makes a hormone called GNRH, and GNRH stimulates the pituitary to make, it's great to see everybody nodding. This is very encouraging to me. So the GNRH stimulates the pituitary gland to make LH and FSH, and then the LH and FSH, they get into the general bloodstream and when they find their way to the ovaries and testicles, if they find specialized receptors there that recognize the LH and FSH, then you will have the production of either estrogen or testosterone. So this, it is interesting that this whole system is active not just at the time of puberty, but it's actually already in place and active even before you're born. 
And this functioning of, the, this, of these uh, systems actually has to do with the development of the external genital structures. We'll talk about that in a minute. This whole system becomes very quiet. It takes a nap like after lunch. I hope you're not sleeping right now. But it takes, uh, the system uh, becomes very quiet uh, in the mid-childhood years, and then through mechanisms that are still not un fully understood, the system wakes up again. Uh, and when the system wakes up again, that's what stimulates the actual physical development of puberty. So here are some pictures that actually show about what these hormones do even before you're born. And what you may see on the left-hand side, it may be a little difficult to see, but on the left-hand side, you see pictures of the developing what we would call female external genitalia. Okay, so where you, where you would see a clitoris, the labia majora, and the labia minora. And on the right-hand side, you see the classic development of what we would refer to as the male external genital structures, meaning the penis and the penile urethra and the scrotum. Now, it turns out that all of us, you may have learned this, all of us are pre-programmed to have the, hum the female development of these structures unless that decision is overridden. And the way that decision can be overridden is if the body is making testosterone and there is a normal functioning testosterone receptor, what will happen is what would otherwise be the labia will fuse together and form a scrotum and what will otherwise be a clitoris will enlarge and become a penis. So the only thing that really determines one fate or the other is simply the presence of testosterone at a critical time before birth, usually the first 12 weeks after birth, after conception, and the presence of a normal functioning testosterone receptor. Those are called the primary sex characteristics. And I mention this simply because we often talk about the secondary sex characteristics, so that must mean we must know first what are the primary sex characteristics. The primary sex characteristics are the ones we are born with. The secondary sex characteristics are the ones that we develop during puberty. So what about puberty? We know that in people with ovaries, puberty starts typically somewhere between 8 and 13 years. If you have testicles, somewhere between 9 and 14 years. And we know this does not happen just in one or two days, but it takes three and a half to four years from start to finish uh, puberty. And here is... A picture now we talked about the primary sex characteristics. Now we can talk about the secondary sex characteristics. Again, these are the physical changes that occur during puberty. And if you look in the, and I'm sorry about the color coding here, um, I don't know if in Vietnam, if you have testicles and you are considered a boy, is everything blue? And if you have ovaries, is everything pink, like in the United States? Yes, no? Yes, okay. So I apologize in advance, <laughs> but this particular cartoon was made this way. And you can see on the left-hand side, you see stages numbers one through five, and you see on the far right side of the blue, you see a little oval structure with a number, three, four, five, etc. That number has to do with how large is the testicle, okay? And that tells us based on the size of the testicle, has the person reached puberty? And how far along are they in puberty? And then if you look on the right-hand side, in pink, you see the different stages for breast development. Either there's no breast development, or you have the beginning and then full breast development. These are called the secondary sex characteristics. Why is this important? This is important. Uh, Dr. Uh, Asa talked about the sensitivity of the physical examination and asking permission for the physical examination. I completely agree with this. Sometimes the information from the physical examination is very important in guiding whether it is time to initiate a treatment. And so we must always still ask for permission and tell the patient that they can decide whether or not there can be a physical examination, but it's so important for us to explain why we want to do the physical examination, and it's not just because 
we're doctors and we must examine someone. What is the information we're going to get and how will we use that information? And still reminding them that it is their decision whether or not the examination will be done. Okay, so why is this important? So you're going to be hearing some more talks tomorrow by my colleagues, Dr. Aaron Saft and also by Dr. Leibowitz that are gonna be talking about the mental health uh, history of very young children who are gender non-conforming. But one of the most important observations that has been made in many parts of the world, but initially in the Netherlands, was that if somebody has developed gender dysphoria before the time of puberty, and this continues into the time that physical puberty has begun, or has begun, has emerged at the time that physical puberty has begun, this is very predictive of somebody's gender identity during their adult life. So that is very important. Even though young children may explore their gender commonly and uh, may at some point in their lives feel that they are not the gender that was implied by their primary sex characteristics, there may be some fluctuation, but there is significant predictability, that is to say that the way a person identifies as the physical changes of puberty begin is very likely the way they will identify during their, their uh, adult life. <clears throat> so what can we do? So I mentioned that I'm a pediatric endocrinologist. Of course, th most of the care before the Dutch began a very new field of work, and they actually began that work about 30 years ago, the majority of the care was focused on adults. But the Dutch, as I mentioned, were one of the groups that recognized that those children that had become adolescents and still felt that they were transgender or really began to intensely feel gender dysphoria as their bodies started to change with the secondary sex characteristics, they wanted help also. And there was a very clever pediatric endocrinologist working in the Netherlands, who was very familiar with a medication called a puberty blocker for a completely different clinical situation. These were very young children who were going through puberty, not at the normal age, but maybe as young as two years old or three years old. And I think in most parts of the world, people would recognize that if you're going through full puberty as young as two or three, that that is not normal and something needs to be done to help that person. Sometimes the early puberty in such cases may be caused by a brain tumor or some disease that needs to be investigated and potentially treated to save someone's life. So about 30 years ago, now 35 years ago, there was the development of a special class of medicines to be used in these children because this medicine would turn off the puberty hormones, but it would do it in a reversible way. And so this was very important because when these children reached the age where it was appropriate to be in puberty, you could remove the medicine and then they would resume in puberty. So this very clever pediatric endocrinologist in the Netherlands said, well, if we know that these people entering puberty are like, that feel that they are transgender now are likely to be transgender through their adult life, why don't we give them the opportunity to receive this treatment? This treatment will put their puberty asleep for some time to give them more time to understand who they are if they need the time. Some kids don't necessarily need more time, but for those that do, they can work with a mental health professional who is very knowledgeable about gender identity. And then if they continue to identify as transgender or non-binary and are very unhappy to go through their pre-programmed puberty, you can continue them on the blocker and then after some time, you can gradually add in the estrogen or the testosterone that matches their affirmed gender identity. This way, they only go through the physical changes of just the one puberty that matches their gender identity. 
Now, of course, these hormones are not going to have any effect on the primary sex characteristics, which is why I spent some time to talk about that. But that is a decision, like what we call bottom surgery, that is a decision that somebody can make once they are older. But if somebody is just walking down the streets, um, they will blend in much more easily if they did not have to go through the wrong puberty first. And so this has been a very exciting uh, new development that was pioneered by uh, the Dutch uh, now about 30 years ago and has gradually worked its way into the WPATH and the Endocrine Society clinical practice guidelines and standards of care. So it's very exciting to know that this approach is now available and when Vietnam is able to begin to provide a care, not just for adults, but also for adolescents, then we will be able to share with you the exciting research that has been done to guide how to safely and effectively uh, use the puberty blockers. And I'm going to show you some of that information and refer you to the resources so that you can keep it. And I, and I'm sure my colleagues here, will be very honored to be able to continue to work with you as we go forward to be able to help uh, as clinical programs are established. So how do we use the puberty blocker? How does a puberty blocker work? So we have another cartoon here. I told you, remember we discussed before, that the puberty hormones start in the brain with GnRH that stimulates the pituitary to make LH and FSH, and then those hormones stimulate the ovaries or testicles to make their sex hormones. The puberty blocker is also called a GnRH agonist because this medicine there basically will work at the level of the pituitary. It doesn't work at the level of the ovaries or the testicles. It basically interferes temporarily with the pituitary's ability to respond to the naturally occurring hormones that would otherwise tell the pituitary to stimulate uh, puberty. And again, the beauty of this medicine is that it is completely reversible. When I started using this medicine in 1985 in my patients with precocious puberty, we had to give it to them by injections three or four or five times a day. Now it can be given by an injection once every six months or even by an implant that can stay under the skin and continue to work for one or two years. So this has really evolved in the last uh, several decades. And again, it's fully reversible and very specific. So this leads to the very important discussion about these blockers from the WPATH standards of care and the Endocrine Society guidelines. And I've highlighted this in red. So basically, if somebody has reached the beginning of physical puberty, how will we know if the beginning of physical puberty has begun? The only way we can really know with certainty is to do this very sensitive physical examination. So therefore, we have to do it in a very sensitive way. And we know that the, just something that you can review, but we know that when the testicles reach a volume of four cc's, that correlates with the beginning of puberty. When you see the beginning of glandular breast tissue, that correlates with the beginning of puberty. So you would never use a blocker to prevent the onset of puberty. You would only use a blocker to prevent the progression of puberty, and that's a very important distinction. So that's why if a person hasn't yet started puberty, there's no reason to use a blocker because there's nothing to block. So that's why we really need to understand where the person is in their physical development. And very, um, almost exactly the same uh, guideline highlighted here in red in the Endocrine Society Clinical Practice Guidelines. So I just want to show you some examples. Here you see uh, two individuals, they are identical twins. They both were assigned male at birth. They both have XY chromosomes. They both, have, um, they both uh, were born with testicles and a penis. But the individual on the left, from a very early age, said that she was a girl. And she always said that she was a girl. And as her body started to develop in male puberty, she was very distressed. 
and she saw a mental health professional, and the mental health professional confirmed the determination that she was indeed transgender and that she was suffering from gender dysphoria. So she was given the opportunity to receive a puberty blocker, the exact kind of medicine that I just showed you. And then after a couple of years, she had the opportunity to receive estrogen in addition to continuing the blocker. So you can see on the right, her brother, who was a teenager, who was not transgender, who went through male puberty, and you can see she does not look like a boy who's trying to look like a girl. She looks like a typical female because her body has primarily, in the pubertal years, only been exposed to estrogen because she had the opportunity to have access to this puberty blocker. And her distress, her emotional distress, about feeling that she was in the wrong body completely disappeared. So this is just simply a very vivid example of how powerful the puberty blocker can be. And this is why it has been endorsed both by WPATH, by the Endocrine Society, by the Asia Pacific Pediatric Endocrine Society, and by all the leading uh, pediatric and adult endocrine societies around the world. And so this is something that I think can be very exciting in Vietnam as Vietnam begins to introduce access to care to also have access to care for adolescents, as somebody had asked about this uh, earlier this morning. So this has really changed the opportunities for care just simply because of this very smart woman uh, Henriette Delamar, a name worth remembering, who unfortunately died of cancer uh, a number of years ago, but she was the one who made this very clever observation, well, not the observation, but the very clever thought to offer puberty blockers to transgender early pubertal youth. And so these families and the providers are very grateful for, for that. So. You know, I'm not really going to spend a lot of time on talking about the different options. I think pictures are probably better than words anyway. Um, but basically, the kind of blocker now that can last for a couple of years, you can imagine, you simply put it under the skin, and then you can forget about it. And then after one or two years, you can take it out and put in a new one. And imagine how different that is than if you had to receive an injection four or five or six times a day as it was when we first started using these medications. And then you see an example of a needle and syringe. We all have <laughs> know about those. And so some people, even though the implant on the left is very convenient, some people don't want to feel that there is anything in their body. And some people would prefer to have simply an injection once every three to six months and not have to worry about having any physical apparatus inside their body. But most of the time when we put it in the skin, it's in the skin under, uh, it's under the skin in the arm, and people forget about that too. So now I'm actually going to show you some data. I think one of the things, you know, we, um, Dr. Asa talked about um, that, that you don't have to be an endocrinologist to, to uh, sorry? That Dr. Asa said that you don't have to be an endocrinologist to uh, become competent in hormone care, and I agree with that. Um, I think that one of the uh, roles of an endocrinologist is to um, understand the nuances of endocrine care and to, um, yes, to try to work together with the rest of the team to try to answer the important questions. Because when a child comes in for care, they not only have questions for the mental health providers, is my child really transgender, for example? Should we do care? But then they want to meet the medical providers because they want to know, is this medicine safe for their children? What does the future look like? And so as a medical provider, and I know many colleagues, whether they're endocrinologists or adolescent medicine specialists or primary care physicians, all feel the responsibility that we have to be able to answer those questions for the parents. So they can feel that we have thought deeply 
about these decisions to treat these kids. And so what I'm going to show you now is the first of two important studies that support the use of blockers. So it's not just a theoretical discussion, but one that is evidence-based. And so both of these studies come from the pioneers in this work. Again, I think it was so wonderful that we had the ambassador from the Netherlands here to support this meeting because they really gave birth to this field, uh, certainly for adolescent care, and had a great influence uh, and still do on adult care uh, as well. So this is, the f this is the first published study, the very first published study, looking at the mental health outcomes of using these puberty blockers in early pubertal adolescents who are transgender. And they were, there were 70 of these individuals. It was only a two-year study, but this is the first study, so I want to show it to you. What you can see are the mental health outcomes. And what they observed was that after two years, there was a marked reduction in depression and a marked reduction in all kinds of emotional problems. And there was a marked improvement in overall mental health functioning. None of the patients during the study withdrew from the study, they all felt that they were happy to be on a blocker, and they all went on to cross-sex hormones. Now, if you're looking at the slide carefully, you might see that their gender dysphoria was unchanged. And you might say, well, gee, if their gender dysphoria was unchanged, is it really a benefit to use the blocker? Well, there was a benefit because it had the benefits that I just showed you, but they still felt that they were in the wrong body, right? Because it didn't, the blocker doesn't change your body. It doesn't cause a sex change of your body. All it does is prevent your body from going through the wrong puberty. So that's why this is an important distinction. Now, this is probably the most important slide I'm going to show during my talk because this is the only long-term observational study of the impact of the model of care that is currently outlined in the WPATH SOC7 and the latest version of the Endocrine Society Clinical Practice Guideline. This is a model of care that was initiated in the Netherlands, and there's three stages to this care. Stage one is using the puberty blockers in adolescents who have reached early puberty and meet the mental health criteria for having gender dysphoria. Okay. Stage two is giving them what we call gender-affirming sex hormones to enable their body to physically transition to come into alignment with their gender identity. And stage three, for those individuals that chose this, and as has been stated many times, not every transgender individual will choose to have genital reconstruction surgery. But this particular study was of 55 adolescents who went through all three stages of this process. And what they did in this study was they looked at the mental health outcomes at the beginning, at the midpoint, and then at the end of all three stages. And what they found, and this is a six-year follow-up study. Again, it's the first long-term study, and I should put long-term in quotes because we all know that six years is not really long term, but it is the longest so far studied uh, study. And it, it underscores the need for truly long term studies so that as providers, whether we're mental health or medical providers, when families come to us, and I, we learned from our Vietnamese colleagues just a couple of days ago that it is not unusual for a physician to worry, are they making, are they doing the right thing? Is something uh, bad going to happen that they're going to feel responsible for years later? I think every doctor around the world or a mental health provider around the world would recognize and understand that, which is why it is so important, I think, to get this research so we have information to inform the decisions that we are making. And so, what this study showed was that at the end of six years, going through all three of these uh, stages of transition, that in this case, the gender dysphoria was now fully resolved by the measures that they were using. The general psychological functioning was improved. And this is the thing that I find the most exciting. When they specifically measured sense of well-being 
overall sense of well-being, and they compared how these individuals were doing in comparison to young, healthy, non-transgender people of the same age in the Netherlands, that these transgender individuals were equivalent or had even better sense of well-being. This has been one of the most powerful studies that we have used in our country, in the United States, and in other countries to help people understand the importance of transgender care for adolescents. But again, it also highlights how little information we have. We have good information, but it also underscores the need for more. Okay, so, so um, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about just what are the potential limitations of, of uh, using the puberty blockers. So we sometimes see people who come to us they're still in puberty, but they have gone well beyond the beginning stages. So a puberty blocker will only cause minimal regression. It won't take you all the way back. So that's why it's optimal to use a puberty blocker, if you can, at the earliest stages of puberty. Now, Dr. Asa also made some reference to bone. All of us uh, that focus, uh, that work as medical doctors, particularly in pediatrics, know that one of the things that happens during adolescence and young adulthood is the achievement of peak bone mass. And this is largely related to having either estrogen or testosterone in our systems. If we put somebody on a puberty blocker to help with their gender dysphoria, we are slowing down the rate of bone mineralization. And so we have to follow that very carefully and make sure that we are not only protecting somebody's mental health, but also protecting their bone health. And we believe that there are ways to do that safely. There are also potential impacts on the brain because we know that brain development continues um, through puberty and young adulthood. And so this is another very important area of research that is only in the very early stages, but is being done now. There's also an impact on fertility. Just because somebody wants to be, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just because somebody happens to be transgender has no impact on their interest in being a parent. Anyone of any gender identity may wish to be a parent and may wish to use their own genetic material. If we put somebody on a puberty blocker at an early stage of puberty and then they continue to transition, they will never reach the ability to have mature eggs or sperm. And so this is another research challenge. Um, and then there are other issues as well. But this really underscores the importance that it is the role of providers, both mental health and medical providers, to always counsel our patients and their families about the potential impact on fertility. We do know that adolescents, many adolescents will come to us actually after they've already completed puberty, but they're not yet adults. And we can encourage them to store sperm or to store eggs. And so this way they do have the ability to uh, preserve fertility. These slides here, I'm not gonna spend much time on. It's just simply when you have the opportunity to provide care for a transgender person and you put them on a puberty blocker, how, would you, how often would you see them and what laboratory studies? You can find all of this information in the clinical practice guideline in great detail. One of the other questions is how long to stay on a puberty blocker and when is the right time to begin, a, to begin testosterone or estrogen? There is a lot of controversy about this. So I would just share with you that just like in Vietnam, in the United States, we are still learning and in many parts of the world, for those people that are doing this care, we are still trying to learn when is the optimal time to provide these hormones. What we do know is that if we start them by about age 14, that this is an age where the outside age where people will normally go through puberty, and if we start at that age, there's probably much less likely risk to bone health and perhaps to mental health as well. So 
<clears throat> what about starting the uh, sex hormones? And so this comes from the uh, WPATH standards of care. And it's important for the medical and mental health team to determine that this person truly does have gender dysphoria, that the person has the ability to make an informed decision. Um, in some countries, uh, people insist that they must reach the age of legal majority before they can receive testosterone or estrogen. So this is very variable uh, according to where the person is. And a lot has been said, particularly in the morning, about whether coexisting mental health conditions would be a barrier. I think two important points were made that bear repeating. One is that often a lot of the distress a person might feel will significantly resolve when a person has gender-affirming care. But just like anyone, transgender or cisgender or agender, anyone can have a mental health problem and that could be true of a transgender person as well. And someone asked a very, I thought, sophisticated question earlier today. If someone had been taking drugs or had psychosis and was having some question about whether, there was some question about whether they had the capacity to make clear decisions, that must be evaluated um, not as a barrier to care, but as a way to help care. <clears throat> So the Endocrine Society guidelines, I've just discussed the WPATH, basically say that we are looking for the, uh, starting treatment when the adolescent, the teenager, can demonstrate the ability to make informed decisions and understands the, comp you know, the consequences of what they're doing. And there are studies that suggest that most people will reach the ability to have informed consent by the age of 16, but there are a number of reasons uh, why it may be important to start before the age of 16, and I've already uh, mentioned the bone health and the uh, anxiety and depression. If you keep somebody suspended in a prepubertal state until the age of 16, for example, you can imagine how distressed somebody might feel, feeling that they are stuck when all of their uh, uh, people of the same age are, are maturing. So what are the hormonal treatments? So uh, Dr. Asa has talked about this. I, I will just give a little bit more detail. Um, basically, pictures are always good. So the, there are two basic classes of estrogen. There are the naturally occurring forms and there are the synthetic forms. The naturally occurring form is 17 beta estradiol. And that is the one because it is the, an exact copy of the natural body substance, that is the one that is the least likely to have negative effects. And probably giving it through the skin is also the safest way to do it. So you can see a coin on the left. Um, it's maybe one to two centimeters in diameter. So that is just to give you an example of the size of the estrogen transdermal patch. And simply, you would change this once every three and a half days, and the person will be receiving directly into the bloodstream the naturally occurring form of estrogen. Um, many people do not want to have something like this on their skin. They may have some difficulties with that, so then we have the opportunity to give them estrogen uh, is a, in a pill, which they would either swallow or put under the tongue. And then there's, of course, has also been mentioned, uh, parenteral, so injectable estradiol. I'm not going to review the expected uh, effects and the potential adverse effects because this is something that is easy for you to review on your own time uh, simply by reviewing the WPATH standards of care and the Endocrine Society guidelines. And it is important to review these because this guides us on what to watch for when we start somebody on treatment, how often we should see them. And it's also important because one of the things I've learned, in part from my transgender colleagues, is that when a person starts on care, they may go through a period where they're very happy because they've started on care, but then they may go through a period where they're very sad. And sometimes they're very sad because even though intellectually, you know, in their minds, they understand that it takes time for their body to develop. 
the physical changes that they're hoping for, but sometimes they don't realize that it's going to take months to a couple of years. And so therefore, it is our responsibility when we are offering care, not just simply to write a prescription, not just simply to order blood tests, but to counsel people on what to look for, to have correct expectations of how long it will take for their body to change. Um, Dr. Asa already mentioned this, but just to reinforce this, uh, we also want to do um, cancer screening, and so we would do this uh, as for any person, whether they were non-transgender or transgender, based on whatever body parts they have. So if you are a transgender male to female or a transgender female, then it would be important to uh, follow the health of the prostate. And um, one thing to remember about feminizing hormone therapy is that you cannot do it with only estrogen. You need to continue to use something to block the production of the testosterone. So if somebody started on a puberty blocker in the early stages of puberty, you can continue that blocker and then gradually add in the estrogen. If we see an adolescent who comes to us after completing puberty, we would manage them the same way as an adult, and you'll be hearing about that from Dr. Safer when he talks, but basically that would be a combination of estrogen and something to block either the production or the action of testosterone. What about uh, progesterone? And uh, Dr. Asa made some reference to that as well. So the primary role, given the name of progesterone, is to promote pregnancy. Uh, but some people, transgender uh, females, question whether or not there would also be a benefit to receiving, in addition to the anti-testosterone and estrogen, also to receive progesterone. There is anecdotal improvement of breast development and of mood and also of libido, but there still is a need for published definitive studies before there can be evidence-based statements. Uh, there was some discussion or uh, allusion to referral rather to the use of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors uh, for those who like to get into the nitty gritty of endocrinology. You will, may remember We've been talking about testosterone, but testosterone is really just the parent molecule for the really active form of testosterone that's called DHT or dihydrotestosterone. And sometimes people who um, have, uh, are transgender uh, females who, whose bodies have a lot of testosterone there, right before it's been blocked, um, some of that testosterone is gonna be converted into the active form and can cause hair loss. And so sometimes these individuals will benefit from a medicine uh, that will block the conversion to the super active form of testosterone to prevent the hair loss. But as you may be thinking through this, if you are on a good puberty blocker that completely lowers down the testosterone, then you don't need such a medication. So that's why it's important to understand the endocrinology, to understand what medicines make sense for which patients. Masculinizing treatment, it just turns out that in contrast to feminizing treatment, where you need both the blocker and estrogen, when it comes to masculinizing treatment, you can do it only with testosterone. You do not need to continue a puberty blocker once you've achieved adult levels of testosterone. And testosterone can be given several different ways. One of the most common ways is by an injection. And this is often given directly by the patients themselves because it used to be given into the muscle but in the last couple of years, people have studied and shown that testosterone can be given by a very small needle given once a week. And patients are very happy with this approach because first of all, they don't have to go to a clinic. They can give it to themselves and it doesn't hurt the same way as a muscle, uh, an injection into the muscle. And they feel much better because their testosterone levels are much more even uh, if they get a weekly injection with a small needle than if they get a muscular injection 
less frequently. And there is an important research study uh, published last year, actually two years ago now, that basically shows that the levels are very stable for up to five days after giving an injection. So if you give the injection once a week, you are going to have pretty good stability with the levels and how you feel. Just like estrogen can be given um, through uh, a patch, through the skin. Testosterone can also be given through a patch through the skin, but also through a gel. And another way um, that is given sometimes that is long lasting is little pellets. They're like rice. I was eating rice today for lunch. I wonder if there was any testosterone in the rice I was receiving. Um, we'll see what happens. Uh, but um, these pellets, uh, are the size of grains of rice, and we can just simply put some of these pellets under the skin, and then a person will have enough testosterone in their body for several months, and then when they want some more, we give them some more rice. No, pellets. Okay. <clears throat> Again, uh, the testosterone expected effects and the potential adverse effects are all outlined in great detail in the clinical practice guideline. Uh, Dr. Asa also mentioned that testosterone is not an effective contraception. In other words, if you have, still have ovaries, even though you're on testosterone, and if your periods have stopped, which it will after, in most patients, after several months of testosterone, we must remember to counsel our patients that there's still the possibility of pregnancy. <clears throat> For non-binary youth, uh, this is much more complicated. All of the guidelines so far, SOC 7 and the Endocrine Society Clinical Practice Guideline, are completely focused on binary management. We do not yet have guidelines for non-binary youth, though I know that this is being addressed in the upcoming uh, standards of care. So that doesn't mean that we can't help these patients. It basically means that we have to be humble and understand the limits of our knowledge. But as clinicians, we know that there is a certain minimal amount of either estrogen or testosterone that the body needs in order to maintain health. So if a patient says, for example, Dr. Asa again gave the example that if a person had their testicles removed but were not starting estrogen, perhaps because of access, that could put their bones at risk. But I mean, if they were not starting estrogen because they didn't want to, they didn't want to have any testosterone, but they didn't want estrogen either, it's our responsibility to counsel them that they must have some threshold amount of either testosterone or estrogen in order to stay healthy. And so these are important questions for which none of us have the answers and we can all learn together in this wonderful world where we're all closer no matter where we are on the planet because of the internet and WhatsApp and everything else. And the ability and airplanes that can bring us uh, close to each other. So um, there are, even though we have made significant progress, there are significant gaps in our knowledge and we do have priorities for research. So I showed you that very important study from the Netherlands and told you that so far that is the only relatively long-term outcome study. And in their study, they have no data using blockers in people under 12 years of age. We know that puberty begins in many people well below 12 years of age. And so there is that need for information. Also in the Netherlands, in their first study, they did not treat anybody with testosterone or estrogen before 16. And yet we know that it may be important to treat at 14 or 15, depending on each individual's needs. And so it is important to have information about using estrogen and testosterone in these younger adolescents. And so there really is a need for long-term outcome studies. And I'm very happy to tell you that, that our center, along with three other centers in the United States, um, in Los Angeles, in Boston, and in Chicago, that we are all working together. Um, we now have um, enrolled uh, 400 transgender adolescents in an actual study so that we can contribute to the pool of information available. So when parents ask us and patients ask us about what are the benefits, 
What are the risks of using blockers? What is the best way to provide testosterone and estrogen that we hope over the years that are coming ahead that we can contribute to answering these questions and that we can all work together around the world because we all have the same challenges and needs. So I come uh, on ban. So I'm going to speak in English, obviously, but we have uh, all of our speakers. Uh, Dr. Sh Safer, I don't believe, spoke today. The second, they're he an endocrinologist uh, from New York. And what we are going to do now is have you all ask questions to individuals or to the group. And we need to stop about uh, five minutes to four. We need to be out of here by 4 p.m. But, but ask any kind of question that you would like. And we will do our best to respond. Thank you. And Gail, did Dr. Gail? Mình hoặc là em xin phép được giới thiệu một lần nữa. Uh, tên đầy đủ là Chu Thanh Hà và uh, Hà sinh ra với cơ thể nữ và Hà là một người chuyển giới nam công khai. Uh, Hà đã sáng lập tổ chức uh, XT Time, một tổ chức của cộng đồng người chuyển giới và người chuyển giới nam tại khu vực Hà Nội được uh, hơn một năm. Và trong vòng hơn bốn năm qua thì Hà đã cùng với cả uh, vụ pháp chế Bộ Y tế vận động cho cái dự thảo luật chuyển đổi giới tính. Và hiện tại thì cứ hàng tháng thì Hà thường xuyên tổ chức các cái cuộc gặp mặt cộng đồng và mỗi một buổi như vậy thì có khoảng hơn 30 người là người chuyển giới nam và nữ trong thành phố để có thể giúp họ lên tiếng hoặc là có thể giải bày các vấn đề mà họ đang gặp phải. Thì rất là vinh dự hôm nay được ngồi trong cái panel này với các tổ với các chuyên gia đến từ WPATH và nếu các anh chị có câu hỏi gì liên quan đến cộng đồng, các vấn đề mà cộng đồng đang gặp phải thì bằng cái kinh nghiệm của mình thì Hà rất là hạnh diện có thể được chia sẻ với các anh chị. Rất cảm ơn ạ. Thank you. Uh, I'm just introducing myself. Uh, I'm Joshua Safer. I'm an endocrinologist, and I am the executive director of the transgender program at Mount Sinai in New York City. I'm Dr. Rin Massey. I'm the psychologist who opened the session, and I am a brother of Ha. I'm Fred Etner, a family practice, family medicine physician in Chicago, and I've been involved with the transgender community for the last 25, 30 years. I'm Randy Etner. I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist in Chicago, and I'm the wife of Dr. Fred Etner. <laughs> I'm a friend of both. Uh, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Steve Rosenthal. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at University of California, San Francisco, and I'm the medical director of our Child and Adolescent Gender Center. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Asa Radix. I'm from New York. I'm internal medicine and infectious disease specialist and also an epidemiologist. Hi, my name is Gail Knutson. I'm a clinical professor in psychiatry at uh, University of British Columbia. Um, and I'm uh, co-leading this with Lynn Fraser in terms of the, for the next uh, 45 minutes. And I'm Lynn Fraser, co-leading with Dr. Knutson, and uh, a psychologist in San Francisco, California. So, uh, so um, already uh, we have a bunch of questions here that have been written. And what I would request of the panelists is if only one person answers the question, um, so that we can have as many questions as possible. And so I'm actually asking Randy the first question. And the question is, are there any uh, official psychological tests for uh, transgender dysphoria? And if, um, and if so, are there any um, ones that are culturally specific that people could use in Vietnam? There actually are no tests that either laboratory tests, clinical tests, or even really psychological tests in most cases, gender dysphoria is a self-disclosed condition. So in other words, the client comes to us and tells us how they feel. And we, being excellent listeners, understand 
and help them and explain if they're unaware what gender dysphoria is. But there are no really culturally specific tests, although there are some tests that do ask questions regarding gender behaviors for children and will attempt to determine a person's gender role preferences, but don't actually determine whether or not a person has gender dysphoria. So as we heard before, a person's identity is something that really only they can determine and express to us. Thank you. I have four quick endocrine questions, and then we can go to the floor. Um, and this is for, actually I'm going to give it to Josh, Dr. Safer. Why with masculine uh, hormone therapies, why don't we need GnRH agonists, but only testosterone? It's a great question. Uh, it, it, it's pretty simple. Strategically, what we're really doing with hormone therapies heavily includes bringing testosterone levels up and down. That's what the um, that's uh, what the biggest difference is between men and women. And so, all we really have to do for a transmasculine regimen is add testosterone. The estrogen levels actually aren't all that different. And in any case, even if they were, the testosterone will um, it will 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 feed back at the um, at the uh, um, centrally. And so the O, um, the estrogen produced in the ovaries will decrease um, as much as would be needed, and the primary estrogen, if you measure it, presumably will be from the conversion of the testosterone to the estrogen. But again, the bottom line is really all we're doing is adding testosterone. Thank you, Dr. Safer. Uh, Dr. Fred Etner, um, uh, why do we, or, or do we, you, do transgender people uh, need hormones until the end of their lives? hormone therapy? Again, there is no scientific basis on how we should dose these hormones. However, experientially, the need for hormones toward the end of life or to our older years, looking at myself in particular, um, is not as great. Um, <clears throat> however, we all need to have an end hormone. As uh, Dr. Rosenthal had spoken about in hormones, it affects every single cell of our body. So if we don't have these hormones, many of our other bodily functions begin to decrease in function and may impact the individual. Thank you. Um, uh, our, this is actually a question uh, for Dr. Rosenthal and actually Paul probably. Um, are puberty blockers available in Vietnam, and what would the cost be? <laughs> who would know that? Who knows the answer? <laughs> Hi, I think. Yeah. Uh, dựa trên kinh nghiệm của mình và trong quá trình mà làm việc với các anh chị em cộng đồng thì ở Việt Nam cái việc mà, mà các bạn cộng đồng có thể tiếp cận với các hormone chủ yếu vẫn là uh, sustenon, uh, testosterone dành cho các bạn chuyển giới từ uh, nữ sang nam và các cái hormone uh, dành cho chuyển, nhóm chuyển giới nữ là, uh, để cung cấp các cái estrogen chứ còn uh, ít khi nghe nói đến các cái puberty blocker nhưng mà bên dưới của anh Sơn thì có thể uh, trả lời thêm về cái câu hỏi đấy ạ Xin nói với hội trường thêm là thực ra cái hormone mà Blocking này thì ở Việt Nam cũng đã có điều trị rồi Nếu các bác sĩ nhi thì đối với những trường hợp mà bị dậy thì sớm ấy, Thì người ta vẫn có thể sử dụng cái hormone này để, để điều trị Cho nên là thực ra thì nó cũng không phải là một cái gì đấy uh, Chưa từng xuất hiện ở Việt Nam Thế nhưng có điều là sử dụng cái hormone đấy thì dành cho người chuyển giới Hoặc là trong cái giai đoạn uh, điều trị phiền muộn giới từ cái lứa tuổi nhỏ ấy Thì hiện tại Việt Nam chưa được sử dụng Thế còn về bản chất về các loại thuốc ấy, thì ở Việt Nam đã sẵn có rồi và dành cho những cái cháu bị dậy thì sớm trước đã. Thế còn về chuyển giới thì chưa chưa có nhiều nghiên cứu. Do you know how much it would cost? Uh, cost thì nó cũng không phải là đắt lắm đâu. <cười> nó cũng là thuốc và được bảo hiểm y tế. Cho nên là cũng không đáng ngại lắm về chuyện có đắt quá hay là rẻ quá không. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, just, just to add on to that, <clears throat> Dr. Myers in Texas has used medroxyprogesterone for many of his patients, young patients, as a puberty blocker in a high dose uh, to forestall the kind of expense that they would incur with Lupron. Just to add to that, uh, that was the gold standard approach for precocious puberty before the availability of puberty blockers. So, so he was just simply extending that knowledge to the transgender uh, care. And for the next question for you, Dr. Rosenthal, how long on average um, should puberty blockers be used? Like what is the end kind of the highest range? Uh, that's a very important and sophisticated question. Um, <clears throat> for one thing, you only need a puberty blocker as long as you have gonads. So if, for example, as part of somebody's care, they have a removal of their ovaries or testicles, then you do not need a blocker anymore. Uh, nothing to block. Um, in our particular program, we alert families that if a decision is taken to start a blocker, that they will, we are not comfortable treating them with a blocker as a monotherapy, as a single treatment beyond the age of 14. Because we believe that after the age of 14, that is when you have an increased likelihood of skeletal health and potentially other risks. So if we do start a blocker, it isn't a question necessarily of how many years. If somebody is in early puberty at nine or 10, and we, you know, and it, there's also, um, not a universal time of starting gender-affirming hormones, but if they started sex hormones at 14 and started puberty at nine, then they might be on blockers for five years, and if they started puberty at 12 and started sex hormones at 14, then it would only be two years. So the risk seems to be more the age at which you continue the blocker rather than the duration of the blocker. Great, thank you. How, you did you have a question? Yeah. Rất là may mắn được mời uh, lên ngồi trên này nên là cũng có một vài câu hỏi muốn tranh thủ hỏi uh, uh, các chuyên gia ngồi ở trên này. Thứ nhất là uh, uh, Hà rất là tò mò về cái mối quan hệ uh, giữa ba người rất là quan trọng trong cái giai đoạn cung cấp dịch vụ cho người chuyển giới. Thứ nhất là uh, cái người được gọi là primary care doctor uh, và surgeon và psychiatrist thì mối quan hệ giữa ba người này là gì và có một cái cơ chế nào để uh, chỉ ra rằng là uh, cái quá trình làm việc giữa ba người này phối hợp với nhau ra sao uh, để uh, giúp cho cái cái uh, quy trình ra quyết định của một người chuyển giới được tốt hơn khi mà họ bắt đầu cái giai đoạn chuyển giới của mình uh, và và đấy là câu thứ nhất ạ. Should I ask all the questions or one uh, one, one, one at a time? Okay. Uh, Dr. Radix. Yeah, um, this is an excellent question, huh? I think it really depends on your uh, how you set the systems up, like how you're going to set the systems up in, in Vietnam. You know, I've worked in places where people work in a like multidisciplinary way in like a single center. Actually, it's very similar to the way they work where Dr. Safer works, where you know they have primary care, the surgeons, and behavioral health all working in the same like same team in a way, right, in the same center, whereas other places, you know, you have individual providers within their own locations, but then have to create um, a mechanism of, of uh, you know, communicating well with each other, which doesn't always work well, right? So you have to, you have to put in a lot of energy and effort. Um, right now, you know, I work in a center that's mainly primary care. We work with places like Dr. Safer's team. We also work with other, with other uh, surgeons. We work with external behavioral health providers, and we have our own internal behavioral health providers. But we've had to, um, we've had to spend a lot of time creating systems that people communicate well with each other. Um, and I think you just have to decide how you're going to make it work here in Vietnam. But it sounds like you have many different layers of systems, so um, you have good opportunities as well. Great. Your next question. Hiện nay thì phiền muộn giới, bức bối giới hay là rối loạn nhận dạng giới thì vẫn là một thuật ngữ đang gây tranh cãi. 
Và thì ở một số nước uh, trong bối cảnh về pháp lý thì uh, các trần đoán liên quan đến phiền muộn giới được coi là một cái cánh cửa đó là người, một người phải được chẩn đoán là phiền muộn giới để có thể tiếp cận với các cái can thiệp y học và bắt đầu uh, tiếp cận với các uh, dịch vụ để định giới. Uh, vậy thì uh, các cái chẩn đoán về phiền muộn giới có thực sự cần thiết không và các cái điều trị cho chứng phiền muộn giới này nó có chạy song song với các cái uh, điều trị hoặc là các cái cung cấp các dịch vụ liên quan đến sức khỏe cho một người chuyển giới không? So is this a question is clear for you? Are you, are you asking um, are you asking whether about ICD and DSM-5 is that or are you asking whether a person has to have a diagnosis to receive care? Uh, because I think that uh, a diagnosis of uh, gender dysphoria is a side of some of the um, psychology in different contexts used mm -hmm. to identify who are trans and then uh, when they are identified as a trans and then they can access services and which is, is a very long uh, it's a lengthy complicated process in some country that take like 10 years 20 years for people to you know oh, okay. enjoy the insurance covered by the then respected country like the case in south africa and other countries as well so is it the, the question so i think it depends I'll, I'll answer part of this I think it depends on how the your system is set up so for and and how the payment uh, works in terms of the system so if you have an ICD system then a person and and what level of ICD you're on for example now it's in gender incongruence and then if you're working in in a DSM-5 system, then it would be gender dysphoria, depending on how the process works. But I think that it does, but people should be able to access care without a diagnosis, and so that they are, as Dr. Etner said, they're coming forward, and we're, we are uh, affirming their care. Does that help? Yeah, I, I, let me expand just a tiny bit so you're aware. I, so the ICD, I think Gail is uh, is what she's saying, but I want to make it very clear. The um, the ICD for the next revision for 11 is going to use a term called gender incongruence, which will be part of sexual health and not part of mental health. So that will just change the way we think about what it even means. Uh, and then the, uh, I mean, we've changed it already, but it will change the words to match reality better. Um, and the second thing is we don't have any test for whether people are transgender or not. And so we depend on people reporting it to us. And that's about as far as it goes, other than making sure that people aren't accidentally reporting it because in a, it's a very unlikely situation. They have some other um, reason why they would be not being correct uh, with their gender identity, which isn't a, li isn't a very likely thing, although it's not zero. Um, then it's just what the person tells us. I also wanted to respond to the question, is the reason we are here is to promote capacity to increase access to care for all trans people and also to reduce barriers to care so that a person can go to any provider and get care for themselves if they are trans. There is another system within the standards of care that does have for surgery, for example, where there are in the WPATH standards of care, where an assessment is done by either a primary care provider or a mental health provider to refer to a surgeon. And I'm not sure what SOC 8 will say about that, but keep in mind that what we all want is the best care for all trans people. And your system, it was so interesting, and I think that I'm looking forward to the next few days when we have an opportunity to learn about your system and talk about the best way to do this process of getting the best care you, in, using your system. However that works, we don't know, okay? 
Ok à, Chỉ thêm một câu nữa thôi ạ à, Vì có quá nhiều câu hỏi Tại vì biết là hôm nay Hà tham dự Nên là các bạn chuyển giới ở nhà Và ở trong thành phố Hồ Chí Minh cũng gửi ra rất nhiều câu hỏi Và chỉ sợ là chúng ta không có nhiều thời gian Nhưng mà trong vòng 4 ngày nữa thì sẽ cố gắng là Bắt cóc các chuyên gia ở đây một vài phút Để đặt câu hỏi ạ à, Có một vài câu hỏi là Ví dụ ở nhóm chuyển giới từ nữ sang nam thì hiện nay mặc dù các bạn đã sử dụng hormone được một thời gian rồi và có đi uh, mình gọi là screening cancer nhưng mà một số bạn thì bị đau rất là nhiều cái vùng bụng dưới và, và vẫn phải trải qua một số các cái uh, uh, chu kỳ là các bạn ấy có những cái uh, uh, không để đảo ngược quay lại các bạn ấy có kinh nguyệt trở lại và các bạn ấy không biết là tìm đến những cái nơi như thế nào mà có thể là bắt đầu cái quy trình của mình ra sao thì có uh, để kiểm tra xem là các bạn ấy có vấn đề gì không bởi vì mặc dù đã đi khám nhưng mà không ra vấn đề gì cả với các bạn mà đã sử dụng hormone từ một năm rưỡi trở lên và tổ uh, các tổ chức cộng đồng nhận được rất nhiều các câu hỏi như vậy. So I understand the, <coughs> the question. Um, this is a particular patient who is regaining menses even though they're on hormonal therapy. Correct. We have that that happens with some frequency. Dosages may not be high enough, and there may be other medical problems that need to be investigated, um, ovarian cysts, other kinds of issues that may be delineated with ultrasound and physical examination, um, depending on other issues. They could be sexual issues as well, sexually transmitted infections and such. Um, but it may be that just the dose is not high enough to suppress. But all those things do need to be investigated before saying I'm going to increase the dose. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, it could be too high. Mm -hmm. <coughs> exactly. It could be too high. Um, and then you would get conversion to estrogen. And that could stimulate also a menstrual period. Besides other complications that you put on, on the screen, polycythemia and such. Dr. Radix, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I don't really have anything to add. I mean, it's it's about finding uh, finding an, a medical provider who's going to be able to do the correct workup, and that the the your friend, your the community member, needs to know that this could potentially be quite serious. For example, what if they had an untreated, I don't know, cervical cancer? Mm -hmm. it could be a polyp. Could be an infection. I mean, these are all things that have to be investigated. If I, could, if I could just add one comment, there's a, an excellent publication um, that you can find uh, through the internet by Carswell and Roberts. So it's Jeremy Carswell uh, and Stephanie Roberts uh, from Transgender Health in 2017 that uh, is, the title is something like Inducing Amenorrhea, and it goes through it in a complete differential diagnosis uh, and uh, you know, algorithm for evaluating and managing uh, the recurrence of uh, either you know, particularly recurring uh, menses or inducing amenorrhea. Thank you. So uh, now we have two more, a uh, couple more questions. Tôi có that have been nhận được một uh, câu hỏi từ các anh chị tham dự viên ạ, cho dành cho các chuyên gia là tuổi sớm nhất có thể sử dụng liệu pháp hóc môn ức chế dậy thì và những biểu hiện nào thì cần phải dừng điều trị ạ. So if I understood, it is what is the age of starting a puberty, what, what age would you start a puberty blocker, then what is the signs of, that you would need to stop a puberty blocker? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah. So, well, let, let me, I'm not sure I understood the last part, but the first part, the, in, the initiation of starting a blocker is not chronological age, but pubertal stage. So that is why it is important to be able to determine if somebody has begun puberty by testicular volume or by the presence of glandular breast tissue. And that, of course, we know can occur at um, a spectrum of, of ages. Uh, in terms of uh, stopping a puberty blocker, um, is the question because somebody is having an adverse effect um, or is it that asking the question, how long can you treat a, use a blocker? That was the first question I was asked, so, so I'm not sure, was somebody talking about a potential adverse effect? Um, we're, 
I'm not aware of a reason why, well, we have not seen adverse effects that would cause someone to stop a blocker. We do know, for example, that you can um, have a slowdown of the bone mineral density acquisition, but we watch very carefully for that. And there are certain treatments we can use if we are seeing significant osteopenia, but not something that would force us to stop a blocker. Great, thank you. Next question, sorry. Rất cảm ơn là cái bài trình bày của các chuyên gia thì thực vì là tôi là làm trong cái lĩnh vực tôi là nhà tâm lý tôi làm việc ở trong cái một cái ở bệnh viện nhi trung ương có trong nhóm làm việc của chúng tôi ấy, thì là có bác sĩ nhà tâm lý và bác sĩ nhi khoa được đào tạo về tâm thần và cả bác sĩ nhi khoa cũng được đào tạo về nội tiết và sản khoa nữa thế thì chính vì thế cho nên là chúng tôi cũng gặp thường thực sự cái vấn đề mà với cái trẻ vị thành niên có vấn đề về phiền muộn giới chúng tôi gặp rất là nhiều thì hiện tại ở Việt Nam ấy, thì chúng tôi chỉ duy nhất là làm cái đánh giá về mặt um, thường phần lớn là chúng tôi đánh giá về cái có những cái vấn đề lo âu trầm cảm ở những bệnh nhân với những cái bạn như thế này và chúng tôi cũng có cái chăm sóc chỉ là thứ nhất là phần lớn là cái chăm sóc về tâm lý thế nhưng mà thực sự là chúng tôi gặp rất là nhiều cái thất bại bởi vì thứ nhất là bản thân cha mẹ khi mà đưa con đi đến khám ấy, thì cái mong muốn của người ta là muốn là cái giới tính sinh học của cái đứa trẻ và người ta cũng không muốn chấp nhận cái đứa trẻ nó có, có cái thay đổi. Và ngược lại thì bản thân với các bạn vị thành niên thì các bạn ấy cũng có một cái khó khăn là các bạn mong muốn vì bạn đến khám vì cái phiền muộn về giới tính. Thế cho nên rằng là bạn cũng muốn là có cái sự thay đổi về mặt giới tính. Thế nhưng ngược lại với chúng tôi thì hiện tại vì ở Việt Nam về mặt một số quy chế về pháp chế, về mặt chuyển giới thì tôi nghĩ chắc là cũng còn hạn chế. Thế chính vì thế cho nên là thường chúng tôi, những cái bạn đó và chúng tôi đặc biệt là tâm lý chúng tôi muốn trợ giúp muốn song hành cùng các bạn với cái cuộc sống này nhưng mà thường rất là khó để các bạn ấy mới quay quay lại gặp lại chúng tôi thì rất là mong là với các chuyên gia đã có rất là nhiều kinh nghiệm trong cái việc mà chăm sóc cái trẻ vị thành niên rất là mong là là các chuyên gia sẽ hỗ trợ chúng tôi và sẽ giúp đỡ chúng tôi về về việc cái chăm sóc những cái cháu vị thành niên thế này. Thank you. I'm going to start with that and um I'm sorry to say this again, but tomorrow, uh, uh, Dr. Aaron Saft and Dr. Um, Leibovitz will be here to talk about children and adolescents, and we'll spend a good part of the morning tomorrow talking about that. So um, I would encourage you to hold your question, because, and it's really important because I know that you had asked it earlier, and I don't want to forget you because it's really important. So thank we will you. remember you tomorrow. We have a question here for Dr. Randy. Um, thank you for all the very uh, interesting uh, presentation today. Um, Dr. Edner, you said that the fear of disclosing and rejecting have the same negative uh, impact on health as the re rejections, right? Yeah, so what, what are your advices to the transgender? Um, so uh, in terms of the fear of disclosing and rejection, what should they do re regarding to their fear of disclosing and rejecting? Um, are you asking, just to be clear, how do we help a client who's very fearful of disclosure? Yeah. I think that we work with them to practice how they can tell the people that need to know. And we help them to think about who needs to know and who doesn't really need to know. And we help them to try to determine how much of the fear is real because so often what we've learned is that it's hard to predict how people will respond. I think, uh, Ren, you gave us a good example of that when you worried about telling your parents and you found that they love you and that they accepted you. And a lot of that worry and fear was really just our anxiety and not necessarily how the other person would respond. And then we support the person if they are rejected. 
and we try to work with the family or with the significant people to help educate them about the person's condition and how necessary their support is to them. Thank you. Um, I do want to say something. Okay. Uh, any other questions? We have five minutes left because we have to end by uh, 3.45. Em xin tự giới thiệu, em là Thúy Anh đến từ khoa nhi của Bệnh viện Tâm Thần ạ. Thì um, em có hai câu hỏi ngắn dành cho các chuyên gia. Câu hỏi thứ nhất là trên thực tế thì có một số cha mẹ khi mà họ đưa bệnh họ đưa con của họ đến bệnh viện thì người ta sẽ yêu cầu là mình uh, có nên làm cái xét nghiệm xác định giới tính cho con họ không. Thì uh, xin các chuyên gia xem cho em cái ý kiến tư vấn là mình có nên làm cái xét nghiệm đặc hiệu này hay không. Câu hỏi thứ hai là khi mà đối diện với vấn đề giới tính của con thì thực sự là một số gia đình họ rất là khủng hoảng và họ không thể chấp nhận được cái chuyện này. Vậy thì trên kinh nghiệm của các chuyên gia thì trong những cái trường hợp như vậy mình nên tư vấn như thế nào cho các gia đình hay là hướng thế nào để mà họ có thể chấp nhận được cái chuyện của các con cái đặc biệt là với những cái trẻ mà chỉ bắt đầu ở lứa tuổi vị thành niên ạ? Uh, do you want to answer it very briefly? Because that that question is perfect for tomorrow and <laughs> I'm sorry because it has to do with Dr. Aaron Saf's practice and Dr. Leibovitz's practice so I feel really bad because <laughs> it's it's a tomorrow question so please ask it tomorrow and uh, also please ask your question tomorrow. Um, we have been asked to um, end for today um, and uh, there are a few questions that are lingering that we are going to actually talk about tomorrow. Um, thank you for writing your questions down. Um, if you would, again, like if you have some questions uh, that uh, were not answered uh, by today's panel and with respect to uh, mental health, uh, primary care, endocrinology, um, like introduction to trans health, please write them down and we will answer them. We're happy to do that. And tomorrow we're going to talk about um, uh, uh, approach to children, adolescents, also about uh, surgery, um, approach uh, ethics, and we'll have met, uh, much more time for questions as well as our colleagues from APTN are going to uh, uh, ask some questions about your attitudes and uh, practices with respect to transgender health. So thank you uh, for uh, your attention today. And uh, do you have do you have any closing? Vâng, chắc là các anh chị tham dự viên vẫn còn rất nhiều các câu hỏi. Thì uh, chúng ta ban tổ chức xin phép là được uh, ghi nhận các câu hỏi của các anh chị. Uh, các anh chị vui lòng ghi lại câu hỏi của mình ra giấy và ban tổ chức sẽ gửi đến các chuyên gia để các chuyên gia có thể giải đáp các anh chị uh, trong các buổi hội thảo trong những ngày tiếp theo. Và trong ngày mai thì chúng ta sẽ tiếp tục với những nội dung cơ bản và kiến thức nền tảng. À, và khóa tập huấn ngày mai thì sẽ bắt đầu lúc 8 giờ 30 phút thì ban tổ chức cũng rất mong muốn là các anh chị có thể uh, có mặt đúng giờ để chúng ta có thể dành nhiều thời gian hơn cho các bài trình bày và dành nhiều thời gian hơn cho những phần thảo luận mà các anh chị còn đang có rất nhiều thắc mắc cần phải giải đáp ạ uh, và ngày mai thì chúng ta cũng sẽ vẫn tiếp tục tập huấn ở hội trường Tôn Thất Tùng vào lúc 8 giờ 30 phút ạ xin chân thành cảm ơn các anh chị và chúc toàn thể các anh chị có một buổi tối vui vẻ ạ xin chân thành cảm ơn ạ